Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. No Such Thing as an Invasive Species? Featuring Professor Matt Chu. Dubbed a gadfly of invasion biology by Scientific American, Matt Chu is known for critiquing ecology's over-reliance on societal metaphors and conservationists' misapplication of notions like nativeness. Dr. Chu has a bachelor's degree in environmental interpretation and a master's degree in range science from Colorado State University and a Ph.D. in biology from Arizona State University. As statewide natural resource planner for Arizona State Parks, he coordinated their Natural Areas Program, researched wildlife issues, and served on interagency committees, one of which also included his future wife, plant ecologist Julie Stromberg, who was a guest in an earlier episode of this podcast. Currently employed at Arizona State University, Dr. Chu conducts a field course in Novel Ecosystems, lectures in History of Biology and Biology in Society, and works with postgraduate students. He was awarded an Oxford Research Fellowship in 2014. His articles in Nature, Science, and other publications have been cited in over 200 different journals. In this episode, I am joined by two co-hosts, Gabe Crawford of the Ground Shots podcast and Nikki Hill. Nikki has a degree in environmental science and has worked in restoration and agriculture. Currently, she invests her energy in wild tending efforts. We co-authored a zine together called The Troubles of Invasive Plants, which you can download for free at my blog. Gabe Crawford was raised on a small homestead outside of Durango, Colorado, and started learning about plants from an early age. He got launched on his plant journey by studying with Katrina Blair at the Turtle Lake Refuge in Durango. He moved to Sandpoint, Idaho, where he worked with Twin Eagles Wilderness School and Kanikskoo Land Trust, mentoring kids. Throughout this, he started naturalist training, which opened him up to the world of wild tending, traditional ecological knowledge, and the ancient and intricate relationships between humans and ecology. Gabe spent time with Fenicia Medrano, learning about the ancient wild gardens of the West that were, and still are, tended by indigenous peoples, and was taught how to tend these first foods and plant back for future abundance. He collects the seeds of native food plants, fruit trees, berries, and other exotics to plant feral orchards and wild gardens. You can follow him on Instagram at Plums for Bums. In this conversation, we take a deep dive into the history of invasion biology and reveal its scientific shortcomings and its cultural biases. This is a crossover episode with the Ground Shots podcast, which was created by Kelly Moody. Ground Shots is an audio project exploring our relationship to ecology through conversations and storytelling. How do we do our work in the modern age when the urgency of ecological and social collapse feels looming? How do we creatively and wholeheartedly navigate our relationships with one another and the land? These and other questions are explored by Kelly and Gabe with a wide range of guests. Find out more at ofsedgeandsalt.com. If you like this episode, please share it on social media. Subscribe to both this podcast and to Ground Shots so that you don't miss future episodes. To support my work financially, you can make a one-time donation to the username Colibri at paypal.me or at Venmo. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. You can also become a member at patreon.com slash Colibri. We will get early access to new episodes, exclusive digital content, and I'll mail some goodies to you. Now here's Professor Matt Chu, interviewed by Gabe Crawford, Nikki Hill, and me. start off by just yeah giving us like a little in our in our listeners a little lowdown on like who you are and 
and uh, what you study and in the, in the context of invasion biology and and how you're kind of known as a critique of invasion biology in many ways, which is pretty cool. I, I think, um, who am I? I'm a bird watcher gone horribly wrong. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I, I, I started out as a child who liked animals, right? And, um, but, you know, clo more proximately, I uh, studied thing like environmental interpretation when I was an undergrad in, in college, which was primarily supposed to be preparation for being like a park naturalist. It was great because I got to take all kinds of courses that I would have taken for fun and I didn't have to take a lot of courses that I wasn't interested in. Um, so a lot of, of sort of organism and species and, and um, natural history based things. Um, from there, I went into environmental consulting actually for a while and learned all about a lot of laws like the you know, National Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act and all the things that we had to do to deal with those for various clients. And I, my clients were private or they were state highway departments or they were the Department of Defense. And, and um, it was quite an array of things to do. From there, I went to work for Arizona State Parks where I was called a natural resources planner and was basically their interagency coordinator for any kind of biology troubleshooting sort of stuff. So I spent a lot of time in meetings um, <laughs> and occasionally you know, could check out a vehicle and go anywhere in Arizona and go bird watching or something like right. that. Um, always with a purpose, but you know, I always had the binoculars. Um, I eventually sort of be, being contrarian in many ways made myself less than welcome at Arizona State Parks. Mm -hmm. And um, in this, about the same time I was working a lot on natural areas issues. We had a state natural areas program and the state natural areas program was um, kind of created by citizen initiative and so whatever was written into that law was written from a sort of collective environmentalist conception of how the world ought to work in Arizona and finding ways to make that uh, function was always interesting. And there were, there were lots of things about it that were kind of at odds with very traditional management, of course. And then there were lots of things that were at odds with sort of up and coming ecological ideas. So we were caught somewhere in the middle in a way and trying to find ways to, to do that. Cause there was money involved. There was money appropriated for this purpose of acquiring natural areas and how to come up with a way to use that money was not always simple the parks board needed some kind of policy, uh, something consistent that they could point to, but they didn't always necessarily want to follow a policy that was produced by you know, sort of semi-academic thinkers because um, it was political too. It was really a, a complicated thing. Mm -hmm. It was during that natural areas period that I really got interested in the problem of what's, what, what belongs to where, okay? I, mean, I was hearing a, the idea of, of invasive species was ramping up in the 1990s uh, as, as a big issue. People were kind of glomming onto this one as, oh yeah, I, I, I feel this, I feel this problem. And so it, uh, it gained a lot of traction, it gained a lot of support, it, gained, it, it made a lot of noise. And uh, the more I thought about it, the stranger it seemed to me. And so that's when I, kind of bailed on all of the, the attempt to manage and decided I needed to figure this out for myself. Mm. And that's, so that became under, understanding those ideas through a sort of a historical process um, was my PhD project. And there was, there was a hole there. There was a, there was a hole to fill in, in the understanding of where these ideas came from and, and how they developed and all of that. And um, I thought it was going to be a, a story that started in the 1950s, 
when I set out to do it because everyone was telling me that it was a story that started in the 1950s. But I found it starting in about 1600. Yeah. Um, so, so it got to be a much different project than what I had kind of imagined at first, but it was fun because again, it was a, it was a place that really nobody had, had dug into this to figure out what was going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of, that's, and I'm, and I'm still doing it. So, so I got my PhD in 2006 at the tender age of 49. I, I beat, I beat 50 to a PhD. <laughs> um, and, uh, and have been kind of carrying on this conversation or argument as it often becomes uh, ever since. So yeah. what was the actual like name of your dissertation? Of my dissertation? Your, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the actual name of my dissertation and it's sitting on the shelf right behind me here and it's about 300, about 300 pages long um, is uh, ending with Elton Preludes to Invasion Biology. Mm. Because instead of beginning in 1958, I ended there. I got to that, I got to the point where I thought I was gonna start and and had already, you know, completed a massive project. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just... So the Elton there, the Elton there is Charles Elton, who's often referred to as sort of the one of the one of the fathers of animal ecology, really, but more recently, he's he's had been invoked quite a bit as sort of the initiator of invasion biology, which isn't really accurate either. But you know, a lot of things aren't accurate. Yeah, and another and some of these other uh, big bigger names like E. O. Wilson, I think, is one of the major uh, names that kind of really influenced the current perspectives on this. Could you speak a little bit to Wilson's influence after Elton? Wilson really, so, so Elton, to, to contextualize Elton a little bit, Elton knew Aldo Leopold and Rachel Carson asked him to write the forward to the British edition of Silent Spring. So he was not unknown. He was a big deal. Elton was central to ecology um, from like the late, from the 1930s well into the 1950s. Um, And his ideas about conservation were very similar to Leopold's. They kind of wrote two different versions of the same thing. Um, But um, so Wilson was just a you know a, pretty much a student around the time that uh, Elton was writing the Ecology of Invasions by Animals and Plants, and Wilson wasn't really heavily into environmental issues or conservation issues at all for a very long time. So he, when he finally did do that, which was not until around 1980, um, when he when he began to first sort of write. Um, with a with a conservation angle and then um his you know it it took a while for his his ideas to develop but ultimately he put in one of his books and i'm trying to i've I've got way too much stuff that i'm sorting through in my head right now but um i think it was the future of life um or the whether that was just the chapter name or the, or the book name, I don't remember. Oh, but is, um, is so this is di- around 19. 19- hmm? Diversity of life. Is that the one? That yeah. Is- yeah. Maybe. So it was around 1986 or something like that. Um, so he made a very short case um, for the idea that introduced species were a problem. And he based it all on a set of papers by some North American freshwater fish biologists. They, re- they had written three sort of interlocking papers about fish conservation and had put in there a lot of um, well, the, the 
a lot of anecdotes. I mean, they, they had based what they were saying a, a lot on anecdotal information because there wasn't really a lot of data. So it was a lot of it was just based on the impressions that people had about what was happening to the taxa that they were studying. What's happening, you know, what one guy says ha happens over here and what she says it happens over there in, in these cases. And so there's a lot of, it's built up a lot of anecdote. And, um, but he made a very, a very sort of categorical claim then about introduced species being a problem, right? Um, this was not a peer reviewed book. This was a, 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 by the point in time when Wilson could just sort of, you know, write something and, and a publisher would, would take it and nobody's gonna fact check it or, you know, do anything like that. Um, and it became, not in itself sort of the, the, the be all and end all of this, but it, it was one of the sort of root statements for modern purposes for people that, that most of us know about. Um, and it was Edward O. Wilson. And so, so that was important because Wilson was important and it became the basis of you know, further work and further claims. Most of, and I've written like 30 pages about, about this crazy kind of recursive process of people citing people who had cited them until it just became, it became known, it became the thing to say that invasive exotic species are the second greatest threat to biodiversity, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. um, so Wilson definitely had a piece of this and he has never backed off of it as far as I know. I've, I've talked to him about it. I've sat next to him and tried to have a conversation about it and he didn't necessarily engage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, um, it's been surprising to me. It's not so surprising anymore, but trying to look into uh, some of the history or where these claims come from, that they're really typically based on one statement or on a few studies. Like it seems to be a reoccurring theme if I follow papers references a few times. One of the one of the really most cited, the, actually literally the, the most cited paper ever in the, in the history of the journal Bioscience, which is the journal of the American Institute of um, Biological Sciences, which institutions belong to, individuals belong to, um, agencies belong to. This is, this is a, a sort of a coordinating group in biology in America. So in bioscience, in their journal, there was, uh, in 1998, 1999, there was an article that came out uh, quantifying threats to, to something to, I don't remember if it was endangered species or or threatened species. I think it was, I think it was, or, or imperiled was or something like that. Quantifying threats to species imperiled in the United States. Was that the Wilcove? Or Pimentel? Wilcove, Wil Wilcove et, al, et al, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so quantifying threats. Um, and uh, this, is, this is the most cited paper ever in the history of bioscience. <laughs> and several of us who have, you know, kind of taken our, taken on the task of analyzing all the rhetoric of this, truly wonder whether most of the people who have cited that paper have ever read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it but that's not actually unusual for, for things that become sort of citation classics. There's almost a tradition of having to cite certain things to, to sort of raise your hand and say, me too, yeah. whether you've whether you know it's it's part of acknowledging that you're part of the group or 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 ex accepting membership in this particular club um and and this i mean that's that sounds kind of shocking if you think science is above all that but it's not mm. um and to get by just the first layer of peer review sometimes it's as simple as that the first thing a, a reviewer will do is go to the bibliography and see who's who you're citing mm. um, 
which is something that is uh, really like I wanted to bring it up from like when I've read your papers, you talked about the kind of you've alluded a little bit to the, the fallibility of um, our God, like in God faith in peer review in the peer review, you know, and how like if it's peer reviewed, then people like don't think to question it or follow the trail, the paper trail and the citation trail and like actually read uh, and pass the abstract and the conclusion of a paper and actually read into all of the paper and the data and stuff. And you mentioned in one of your papers how um, Wilson's claim, which was drawn from, you know, basically anecdotal opinions about freshwater uh, fish species basically got uh, accepted immediately into peer reviewed circles. And then that created this kind of positive feedback loop that like, since it was, since it was in the peer review loop, it hasn't really seemed to leave yet because people have like this, uh, this faith in peer review in the peer review. And I, I'm not like denigrating like the value of peer review, but I think it's also just like good to acknowledge um, that, yeah, you've kind of pointed out the fallibility in like, and uh, not in like how it's important to take it with a grain of salt and actually do your own research and like follow the paper tra trails and stuff. Science is a human endeavor and all <laughs> the things that, all the things that humans are susceptible to uh, can be found there. That's why we have uh, lots of people who are historians of science or sociologists of science or philosophers of science. Um, I, I, there should be a psychology of science out there okay. somewhere um, because it's, it's definitely people doing things. And there are millions, literally now, there are millions of peer reviewed papers published every year. And in order to stay sort of relevant and on the cutting edge of whatever kind of um, sub-discipline anyone's offering. There's a certain amount of just having to take authority. I'm not sure that we would say take it on faith, but take authority as read. And it's a well-known problem that very few experimental studies ever get replicated to see if somebody else gets the same results. I mean, even if the um, data are made available and all the procedures are well understood, just replicating someone else's study is not really necessarily a way to, to move forward in academia. It's really necessary Mm -hmm. but it just doesn't get done as much as it should. And this is, these are the kind of problems that are, are sort of dis discussed internally in science, but they don't necessarily, people don't necessarily want to sort of hang this washing out for everybody to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but this is a funding issue too also, isn't it? Isn't it that, that people are less likely to get um, funded if all they're doing is replicating an older study, right? Um, in, well, there's at least a perception of that. Um, how do you, making a name for yourself, showing that you're relevant, showing that you're um, making an original contribution to knowledge. When you do a PhD, that is one of the criteria for doing a PhD. Are right. you making an original contribution to knowledge? So it's baked in to this, I, to this whole process that you aren't just here to sort of check out what somebody else was doing. Your status, your tenure, your future kind of depends on being able to demonstrate that you are doing something new and relevant yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's a little ironic then that if you don't spend enough time checking out all of these foundation stones that you were building your ideas on, you could easily sort of wander off into some sort of strange um, cul-de-sac, dead end, whatever, because, because you've taken as given a certain set of ideas um, that then turn out maybe not to be as, as <laughs> literally as foundational as, as you need them to be. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so it's somewhere we get onto where there's enough cognitive dissonance that part of this wall crumbles and you have to sort of figure out how to fix it from there. Um, hopefully we're not running into too many hugely foundational mistakes about like the nature of matter and, and, and things like that. But, <laughs> um, but some of this stuff in ecology, ecology is so full of contingencies, that's a good historian word, um, and of um, complexities that we can really rush to generalize a little too quickly in order to try and, you know, because you want to make a, everybody wants to make a big general point, just saying, well, I've just learned a whole lot more about this population of birds in this corner of Nevada or something like that is not as interesting or impressive as saying I've kind of got a new principle, if not a law of nature, at least some kind of some kind of rule that, that you know, everything follows. Yeah. So yeah, that's actually, a, it's a good segue into this question. Uh, we were all discussing last night, Nikki and Calibri and I of um, how much of invasion biology is has its origin scientifically versus culturally. And if they're and even like, separable. Yeah. yeah. Or institutionally, even right. There, there's a lot. There's a lot going on there. Um, the first, I think, the, the the things that we have to kind of begin to take into account to understand this are ideas like what's a place, um, or an ideas about what's a species, or ideas about what's an ecosystem or what's a plant community, which of these things are real things and which of them are ideas that we are kind of building up in order to, as models yeah. or as metaphors for these things that we see. How much of, how much of what we're doing, remember ecology and e economy come from that same root, that eco root, which is literally in Greek, the household. Hmm. It's a study of the, it's, so ecology is, is, would literally be sort of the study of the household. Um, so it's, there's, a, there's a metaphor baked in right from the, right from the beginning when Ernst Haeckel in 1866 or whenever he said, I'm, you know, this is ecology and this is what I'm gonna, I'm going to think about this. Well, he thought about all kinds of things and he had all kinds of interesting ideas, some of which were, you know, from our perspective, plainly nuts, but that's the way science works is we try nutty ideas and, and some of them work and some of them don't. Um, so it goes, it goes way back, but the first, and the first thinking about places and belonging was sort of inspired by Europeans starting to spread out across the world and finding themselves confronted with very different plants and animals than they were aware of in, in living under very different conditions. And, and so to the extent that the old model was sort of the Genesis biblical creation, how did all of this fit into, into that narrative? Um, these were things that just weren't mentioned. These were places that weren't mentioned. These were, these were, um, you know, sort of natural histories that were, how, how do we, how do we use this as a natural theology kind of mm. way to, to understand what we have understood about ourselves so far. Um, so by about the 1830s, there was this idea that was starting to get some discussion of when people were realizing that not all the plants that are here, wherever here is, not all the plants that are here now have always been here. Mm -hmm. And it, we can begin making the case that some of them are here because people brought them here. And so even the plants that we were farming um, so we're, let's, we're thinking about Britain now, because this is where this is kind of the evidence is for this kind of thinking. Um, so in Britain, you're trying to grow wheat or you're trying to grow whatever, whatever your crop is. Um, 
And people are saying, well, where did this come from originally? And there's enough exploration going on. Oh, well, they're growing wheat over there and they're growing wheat over there. And, and people begin thinking about, so how did it, get, did it come from over there? And, and all of that. And then other just sort of empirical process was improving and the ability to distinguish different kinds of plants was improving. Taxonomy was coming along as a, a new thing. Um, people were talking to each other across space about, you yeah, know, well, we have that over here too, right? This, so, so where do these plants live? How big an area do they, do they live in and how much, um, you know, wh where is the edge? Where is the edge of where they can live and why? Um, and which of the things that are around, you know, kind of growing around the house here out in the garden are growing here because we brought them in or some of our precursors or some of, you know, which of these things are, are, are here because people are here and which of these things are here because they just are spontaneous productions of this place. There's a lot of complication going on. So, and, and so people were making floras, they were making lists of the plants that grew anywhere in particular uh, and comparing those lists. So this just became a big hobby. This was this was before mm -hmm. botany really became professional, right? This, this was something that people who had time on their hands and and the wherewithal to do it um, could go out and do it for fun. And so a lot of the early botanists were were very much, um, you know, just hobbyists. After after the people who had to be botanists because they were looking for medicinal stuff, you know, which was all throughout any history that anybody could recall that then now there's this new kind of botany where people are just doing this for fun mm -hmm. um and they got way into it i mean there's serious dilettantes at this um but as that developed and it also became a more academic thing too as does some of these will um people had to we're, we're trying to decide how to answer Notate their floras, their lists of plants, to make it clear which one, which of the plants seem to be here now. This place plants that have always been here, whether God put them here or whether, or whether you know, however they got here, they didn't get here because people brought them in. Mm -hmm. That was you know, we we we've got this dichotomy between the human and natural that is sort of really familiar to everyone. Um, and that formed the basis of this. Okay, so these things that are, these things that so, we think someone brought in, we have some evidence to suggest that they have this human history of transportation. Um, and we're gonna mark those somehow. So the list tended to start developing various kinds of asterisks and daggers and other kind of kind of the little marks that were stuck on them and, and explained elsewhere. Finally, somebody said, well, I'm, I'm just gonna take this idea of some, some ideas out of English common law and, and apply them to this. And this was the moment when he said, I'm gonna use native this way. Native used to just mean spontaneously occurring. It didn't have anything to do with deep origins. It just meant that anything that was native was just out there. It's there when you got them. I mean, it's just out there and nobody planted it. Nobody husbanded it, however you want to put that. Um, but he says, I'm going to take native to mean there's no evidence that people moved it. Thus, it's presumably a local production because we have no evidence of anything else. These other things that people brought in, I'm gonna call alien because that's the term we use for people who are crossing borders. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the moment, I mean, that this, this guy whose name was uh, Hewitt Cottrell Watson, H.C. Watson, who had been educated as a lawyer, educated as a doctor, um, mm -hmm. and didn't do either one of them because he didn't have to, because he inherited enough money to, to just go on and do his other thing. And he had seven older sisters that he had to, to figure out how to marry off. And, um, but he was, you know, he had the money and this was his deep interest. He'd gotten into it when he was learning medicine. Um, 
but he says, okay, so I know, I know this, these legal terms and I'm going to take these and a few others and I'm going to apply them to the botanical thing. So we have a way to talk about this now. 1847, and it's stuck. And it's stuck through the Darwinian revolution. It's stuck through all of genetics. It's stuck through, um, it's stuck through the whole history of, of biology as we know it really, because most of what we know of from biology kind of happened after that. Somehow this idea survived through all of those events and remained actually untouched into the present day. It's the same idea. Either people moved it here or they didn't. Mm -hmm. So it's still this dichotomy between human and human agency and some kind of other you know, nature. And so his interest in, in, in applying these, these labels was just academic basically, or? Yes, it was primarily. He never, Watson in, in everything I've been able to find never spent time saying this should not have happened. Right. This is a bad thing. He was making a point about and this is sort of following on work that was that was done by Alexander von Humboldt. Lots of naturalists in the 19th century really wanted to emulate Alexander von Humboldt and Humboldt's ideas about how, how things growing or living in a place were sort of expressions of some um, important aspect, some important reality about that. So you go somewhere and you make a list of all the things you see and those are expressing that place. But if people are bringing them in, then that's, that's getting, that's messing up that, you know, it's obscuring that uh, expression somehow a little bit. Um, but Watson, no, Watson was just trying to find a way to talk about these because there was no vocabulary yet. And he also, because making lists, making floras uh, and doing like sort of creating phytogeography, this the plant geography, creating maps of plants um, was part of his thing. There was a lot of sort of competitiveness in this game of, of among dilettante amateur naturalists. And he sat at the center of sort of a exchange program of specimens from all over the, from all over Great Britain people that press the same way we, we, if you've ever seen a herbarium sample, the same way we now dry and press plants. He was one of the people who sort of developed part of that, that um, practice and, and standardized how labels should be done and all of those things. And he, uh, he suspected often that some of these people were actually moving plants to new places themselves and then claiming to have discovered them. <laughs> so he was more worried about this. He was more worried about this aspect of it than he was worried about the fact that there were plants that people had introduced per se. And that, you know, he wasn't worried about there being some sort of violation of, of nature by doing this. He was more worried about people trying to take credit for things that they you know, shouldn't really be taking credit for. Hmm. And this, this was around the time of the whole acclimatization societies when the English colonial globalizing power was literally moving plant species all over the globe. There was a, uh, and the acclimatization societies, that was like their, their quest to move as many species around the globe as possible. And it was kind of in, in uh, conjunction with, um, as the as the English basically colonized and, and started to globalize all of these different places around the world, they were trying, there was an economic plantation motive. And so they were in the motive of the acclimatization society, they were moving plants to different places where they could basically create a cash crop of something that would grow there and then basically create a business monopoly on that and enslave the local people to grow it. And, um, you know, this, does that, you know what I'm talking about? And then, and then, uh, I, I do, and I, but I want to, but I want to make a point about that, that the, the original acclimatization societies 
were basically homesick people who were trying to find ways to grow the stuff they had at home. Yeah. Um, and so the, uh, the empire building is definitely one aspect of empire building. I mean, you know, um, so the problem of colonial powers was that, you know, they grabbed and controlled what territory they could, but they didn't always grab the territory that had um, the plant or animals materials to exploit in a big way. So there was a lot of sort of bio prospecting and bio espionage going mm -hmm. on where people were, were moving from one colonial, you know, places controlled by one colonial power to another trying to get hold of these things and smuggle them and move them around. Um, and it was going on certainly early, before the 19th century and on, and on continuing well into the 19th century, depending on what's, who, who was at war with whom and, um, and, and even into the 20th century. I mean, with World War II, there was concern about where are we going to get rubber? So creating new rubber plantations um, outside the ones that that had become, uh, you know, inaccessible, unavailable, um, was was a thing even even into the middle of the twentieth century. But and and stories like mutiny on the bounty, if you you know, that's like, well, what does that got to do with anything? Well, um, the bounties that there was a real story, and the bounties cargo, if I remember correctly, were breadfruit trees. They were being moved. Wow because breadfruit was one of those things to go back to your point that would, would provide a staple diet for, for people who were forced into labor or, or literally completely enslaved in the process. Yeah. Um, so this was this, yes, this was definitely going on, but acclimatization per se was um, kind of a, a more interesting thing than just how do we best uh, impose the the empire on these people? It was it was a lot of it started out was this, you know, can can we get the stuff we're familiar with to grow here? Yeah, they missed they missed their uh, English gardens and they wanted to bring the English gardens around the world with them and yeah, that's really that's that's really interesting because you know the um, which I do want to kind of get some historical context like this you're kind of alluding to it where you said like uh alluding to your paper of ending with elton you know you said it this this history goes back to the 1600s could you uh expand on that a little bit and give us like some historical context off of like what you kind of just talked about in order for this whole thing to become an issue at all you need to have people traveling pretty long distances relatively quickly. Um, and that became possible with developments in seafaring primarily, you know, I mean, there was a lot of, as, as ships became more dependable, faster, um, literally higher tech, they're still sailing ships, but, but the possibility of going anywhere in the world, once we, once people figured out that there was a, a you know, that, that you could go out there and head off in some direction and, and, and land somewhere else as, as the, you know, the idea of the, of the earth as a sphere was very, very old actually, but it was, you know, now that it was sort of practically demonstrated and people were getting in ships and heading off to see what they could find, to see if they could find quicker ways um, to get to places they already knew about. Well, if we go this way, we know we can get to, to India, but we have to, we have to go all the way around Africa and that's a pain. So what happens if we go the other way? Can we get to India, right? So this is what Columbus was trying to do. Um, and gradually they were, they were mapping the world in the process, but um, so the technology is getting better. People are surviving these voyages. They're bringing materials back with them from longer distances quicker, which means that anything that sort of latches onto the ship in the process is also making this voyage. Um, anything that's in the, the 
ballast and the, the time ballast was the dry material was usually rocks because your cargo wasn't always particularly massive or weighty enough to keep your ship upright. So they were, were adjusting things with, with uh, inert materials and inert materials are often never, are often not completely inert, right? So there's stuff in there besides the rocks, there's seeds, there's uh, like eggs, there's whatever of, of insects and things like that. And, um, and you get to the next port and you change your cargo and you've got to add ballast or remove ballast and you weren't allowed to throw the ballast in the water because that would just fill up the docks with rocks. So it all had to be taken out and dumped up on the hillside somewhere. Mm. And so things started growing out of this material that had not been seen before, right? Because there's just, there's just seeds in there. And as early as um, around, well, the, the publication of this was actually in like 1626, but, but um, so Francis Bacon had correspondents who were Italian botanists and he didn't really specify who he was talking to when he mentions that there are these new plants growing out of the ballast heaps. Um, and so like, what's this about? It's just more raising the question, but the observations were being made that there were, there was stuff that was, that was, let's say, I would call unmanifested cargo. It's not on the list anywhere, but, but it turns up, you know, at the other end of the voyage. Um, and uh, so this is, this is the earliest I've seen good discussions of, of, uh, the sort of long distance movement. But bef a part of the problem is before this, plants, which, I mean, local plants and animals were well enough known in practical terms to the people who encountered them all the time, but there was not a science of this. There was not an overarching taxonomy or inventory of what we would later, you know, maybe call biodiversity. Um, so it was quite a confluence of their becoming enough information that people could actually talk about this and be sure they were talking about the same things or compare specimens and all of that stuff had to be happening before you could even know whether something was new, right? You couldn't, you know, well, I've never seen it. Have you ever seen it? No, well, I guess we've just never seen it. That would be one way to approach this because, you know, because there's just no underlying database to, to work from. Once the data started collecting and people started developing particular expertise in these things and they could send materials to each other and say, is this what I, you know, are we talking about the same thing? And so this is the kind, of, the kind of practice that had to be in place before people could even begin to have these conversations. Um, so yeah, as, as there's more, um, sort of <laughs> literally more globalization um, in, in trade within and between uh, these empires, there is more stuff being moved as a result, inadvertently or on purpose. Um, we always, you see, this is one of those things you'll see kind of as just a repeated little statement you'll, you'll find in, in discussions of introduced species as it's important for some reason whether it was moved on purpose or whether it was an accident. Um, it's really arbitrary. And, well, it is, but it isn't because if we moved it on purpose and it did what we wanted it to, it's fine. It's not a problem. Think of the whole United States Midwest covered in two or three crops, primarily corn, right. wheat, soybeans. We brought those over from somewhere else. We put them in the ground here. They did what we wanted. They're great. They've wiped whole ecosystems off the map um, in the process uh, of being tended by people like us, you know. But um, but that's not a problem because they're corn, wheat, and soybeans, and they're you know we eat those and they're fine. So it is there is there is actually something going on in there. Yeah. Um, it's when you introduce something and it doesn't behave the way you expect it to that you can then start blaming it for being a bad actor. <laughs> um, even though, you know, it's, it's not like it was, despite, despite the, the, the common um, uh, metaphor of these things as hitchhikers or stowaways, 
I'm yeah. pretty sure no planet or animal has ever stuck out a thumb and, and stopped a ship or a car and said, hey, buddy, you know. And, um, and certainly they haven't gotten on a ship hoping to be carried away somewhere else because that requires a really complex set of comprehensions, you know, to even imagine that I'm here, much less that I could be somewhere else and, and, and have then some method for getting there. Now, that's all really complicated stuff, but we throw those metaphors around like, oh yeah, that plant's a hitchhiker or that, that bivalve is a hitchhiker. I was just reading something, um, a, a report that some zebra mussels showed up on, on uh, some plants that were being imported for the aquarium, aquarium trade. And here in a federal database, it says they're hitchhiking. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> okay, well, that's a way to think about it, but I, I don't see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, th I think that um, like uh, uh, something that comes up for me in these conversations about thinking about plants and animals moving more um, is that I feel like we're still leaving out the part of pre-European history and categorization. Like, mm -hmm. um, there's other people who can speak better to this than I can, but uh, plants were moving with people before Europeans were finding these ways of talking about plants moving. Like if we think about the Polynesian islands, those people came from far away to start colonizing them before modern, you know, more technically advanced ships. And just on this continent, um, the, the places we've been investigating and curious about uh, seeing how so much of the landscape was tended and some of, of these plants actually came from far away a long time ago. So I feel like that part of the conversation isn't brought in enough. Um, yeah. uh, well understanding that science is a human endeavor and it's full of bias and possibly inseparable from cultural perspectives, that that seems like an important thing to bring forward talking about these things now too, is that it isn't actually anything new. Speeds, rates, and intention might be different, but I'm, not, I'm still not sure <laughs> about any of that. Um, well, I, you know, I, I think that our general understanding of, of context has certainly changed over time. Um, but absolutely, it's true that almost none of the major sort of crops that are grown around the world are primarily grown where they, where their precursors evolved, right? So they have been moved a lot. And things that we, so in North America, things that we typically identify as our native crops like corn, you know, maize. Um, well, Squanto didn't find that growing wild and then just start planting some more of it. This stuff was traded up from Central America where it was um, considerably altered in the process of, of some um, selective breeding, which may or may not have been particularly intentional, but it certainly had outcomes that were, yeah. that were useful. Um, there are very few crops in, if any, that we could think of in, you know, in Arizona where I live that are, that came from here, that were just developed here, right? They came from elsewhere. Um, and that's, <clears throat> that really wasn't understood. The beginnings of the understanding that, uh, of all that didn't come until um, I think around, I'm trying to think, let me get my decade wrong, but, but into the, we can say into the latter half of the 19th century, people started looking at these things and saying, well, I wonder where that came from and beginning to, to collect information um, both from historical accounts from other parts of the world and just the evidence, you know, the actual beginning of being able to collect evidence for um, some distant origin. And I think, and, and so that's actually a, a really pretty well developed 
um, endeavor to figure out this whole sort of biogeography thing where and where stuff came from. But I don't think there's been much incentive to use it to say, well, that's really interesting and, and that's just the way the world works because there seems to be much more interest in finding ways to complain about the things we don't like and support those complaints with particular kinds of information or, or references. Um, Cause it really kind of starts with complaining about the things we don't like and then looking for evidence <laughs> to say, and here's why you should agree with me. It's not because you should dislike it too, but you should hate this thing for some other reason. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and inherent in this whole process from its inception seems this um, this insistence that, like you spoke to it, the human and nature nature dichotomy, that humans are separate from nature when really we're just another uh, mammalian being, you know, and like, uh, and, and, and our capacity to move plants and uh, modify our habitat and environment by moving around plants that are favorable to our cultural development and like health and well-being. You know, we're really just displaying our natural mammal behavior by doing that, you know, because we're like an inseparable part of like the ecology, the home, right? The, these places that we call home, you know, and that's like one of the difficult things about this conversation is that um, just like the misanthropic uh, insistence that humans are separate from nature and that we're not like a just another species you know there's deep traditions in many cultures that explain why humans are different it's really hard to find ways to and whether overcoming that is what we're after or what, it's, it's very hard to, to kind of overcome the, there's a lot, there's a lot going on here with, with power relationships and authority and who gets to say and who's, who gets to benefit. I mean, this is, these are really massive um, questions that all bear on the human condition, right? Um, yeah. So if we were to say that humans are evolved the same way anything else apparently evolved through a process of natural selection and, um, and we have a particular, what, what, often people say that humans are generalists and there's this idea of the difference between generalists and specialists in the world. And there are some there are some plants and animals that are that are highly specialized for something, and then there are others that are, you know, they're generalists in another way. Um, honestly, I think humans are highly specialized rather than being generalists. I think we're highly specialized to do a couple of things. And one of those is to imagine the future. And imagine the outcome of, you know, to see processes and imagine what comes next. This is good old Sesame Street stuff. What happens next, you know? Um, and, then, and then the other thing is we, we were fortunate to, to develop um, some capacity for manipulation. Partly, partly literally the manipulation of, of the hand, you know, and then, and then by developing extensions you know, of the hand in effect that are larger and smaller and all of that. Um, so having this, having these specializations of imagining a future, even if it's only a few seconds into the future or if it's way out into the future, how to having this future and this ability to man manipulate, then what do we do? How do, how do we get from here to there? This is, this is our specialization. Um, but we're uh, we're not necessarily very good at unintended consequences, you know. It, it, trying to figure out how to keep something from happening as as a as a an adjunct to whatever it was we had in mind. Um, 
you know, you can see that all around you all the time. It's easy to, it's, okay, say it's relatively easy to, to create a machine. It's hard to keep that machine from not wearing out and breaking down sometime. And, uh, yeah, to, to think about that for a little while and, and all sorts of, of problems begin to kind of come into focus that we, we don't, we don't have a huge capacity to, to understand every outcome of something we're trying to do. We're focused on the focused on that thing we want to accomplish. And along the way, other stuff happens. Um, and, and it all gets much more complicated than that. I wanted to bring it back to the uh, timeline of talking about mm -hmm. um, how these concepts of uh, native and, and uh, alien, uh, you talked about how they go back to the 1600s of observations of this, how in the 1850s was when we sort of drew out, okay, here's, here's the two categories. Uh, but then uh, at what level did the, did the sort of demonization come in? The, 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 I guess the first story I've heard about that was in the 30s that the Germans were the first to sort of start demonizing uh, plants that were not native. Uh, I think it probably, I think it started much before that. I think okay. it was not long after the idea of native and aliens sort of were attached mm -hmm. to the idea of introduced or not introduced. That this is, as a, as a, a Canadian um, ecologist named Brendan Larson, who, who looked into this, is one of the first people whose, whose work was really, you know, useful for this purpose, where he just started looking into the metaphorical kind of composition of some of these ideas and, and happened upon the idea of constitutive metaphors or root metaphors, it's kind of two, two ways of saying the same thing. Um, and there are some metaphors that are so kind of powerfully associated in, in, in human minds that it's very hard mm -hmm. to control them once they're out of you know, once they're out of the box. I'm sorry, I'm surrounded by dogs at the moment, so we can hear all kinds of interesting noises. But um, um, and, and this idea of the invader is turns out to be sort of one of these metaphors that you cannot ever take all of the, you, you can't rid invader of all of its baggage and just say, well, I'm only talking about invasive in this very specific biological sense. It has nothing to do with, you know, people coming over the border with guns and tanks and doing something. Um, it's just, you know, but no, you can't, you can never separate this idea of, of invasion uh, successfully from bad intentions and sort of exercise of force and all of that stuff invasion that's invasion because if it's if that's not invasion then you need a different word mm -hmm. you know you cannot right. just say i'm going to talk about invasion this way and don't ever think about it the other way while i'm saying it over and over again um so this is one of these one of these very very strong uh concepts that that you just you can't peel out that important meaning from uh, so as soon as people are talking about this, then it begins to take on that kind of connotation. And I can find, when I, when I was doing the dissertation research, I found a variety of people over time who would use it more that way and other people who, were, who wouldn't necessarily go with those terms. And in fact, by the, by the 1890s, there were already people who were thinking, you know, we need a different set of words that is, that is more objective. And so um, let's pick some root words out of Greek to use because the Greek is going to be, you know, a more scientific sounding kind of language. And so we, so instead of, instead of aliens, we have neophytes and the neo, the word neophyte has, it has taken on a much broader sense, but neophyte is new plant, right? So this is the new plants versus the old plants. There's archaeophytes, the old plants, there's neophytes. And then there's, <laughs> there are huge numbers of different kinds of fights um, uh, that 
were already sort of in discussion. There were plants that, that because all these fight words had to do with local adaptations, things that lived on rocks, things that lived underwater. You know, there's there's just fight, fight, fight. All these words. And that's um, uh, and just for listeners, that's P H Y T. Yes. Yes. Not Although I do. Used. Right. <laughs> I, I do have a file somewhere in my computer that has a list of all these, and I titled it "Fight Song." Uh-huh. But, um, yeah, so so P H Y T is the, is the Greek for for plant. Um, so phyto. When we talk about phytoplankton, that's a word you might have heard. So phytoplankton is is the the non animal part of plankton. It's the more it's the algae and stuff like that. Um, and then there's zooplankton, right? So zoo, zoo is the is the Greek for animal, and phyto is the, is for and not phyto like the dogs over here. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, it, it can it, it gets out of control. Anyway, so but but by by 1900, there were people who were trying to find these other ways to talk about this that were not so fraught. So it was it was well underway. And whether so, there's there's often a, a a reference back to to Nazi Germany and the fact that the Nazi the Nazis were trying to among all of the things they were trying to do they they were trying to create um, a more German or return to a more German um, condition overall, which included the landscape. Um, so this and so it seems to be definitely part of the program was. Um, but it's, I think, too closely associating it with the Nazis. I mean, they were just one in a long line of people who came before and after who had this idea of this place, our place, our stuff, our, our correctness, um, and the, the attempt to sort of exercise control, return it to some previous preferable correct state. Um, rather than accepting what was going on um, at the time um, as, as just being part of a, a, an, an inevitable change. Do you, so just as an aside, do you want me to do something about the dogs or are they causing a problem? I, I think it's okay, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. all right, then we'll, we'll, we'll let them do their thing. Uh-huh. Right. So um, how it is. That, that's certainly another cultural that starts to get us into all sorts of cultural areas when we talk about uh, the original state of an area and how the original state might be good and all this. I mean, here we get into what Greek ideas of a golden age. Here we get into a garden of I- Garden of Eden ideal. I mean, you know, to to associate an older time with being a being the the, the pure or the better one somehow. You know, before a fall. I mean, the, you know, just. We we started this conversation talking about the cultural as well as the scientific elements related to, you know, so-called invasion biology, and I'm just seeing that again here. Yeah. Well, I think you know, you, there's other places to find it. You can find it in the Wilderness Act. Right. 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 This this nature, you know, these places untrammeled by man. And then you have to figure out what does trammeled mean? How much trammeling have you done lately? And how, how exactly do you accomplish trammeling? <laughs> right. What is that? What does that entail? Yeah. It's one of those words. Is, yeah, I think I kind of know what that means, but but really, what's a trammel anyway? Um, yeah, so it, it's a it's a continuing theme of of trying to of recognizing that something is problematic, recognizing that it's not necessarily the way I would like it to be, that some places have been. Um, fundamentally altered and become uninhabitable to many of the things that might've been there once. Um, and in, place, in some other places, they're still heavily inhabited but by stuff from somewhere else. I think uh, like San Francisco Bay is the classic example of a, of a body of water. I mean, even though it's open to the ocean, right? San Francisco yeah. Bay, most of the biota are introduced now from somewhere at some point, accidentally or on purpose, a lot of it accidentally, because a lot of it just comes in on shipping. And um, so there's been a massive replacement of what lived there once upon a time. But other things that affected that are how we manage the rivers that flowed into that. And I mean, it's, it's a, lots and lots of, lots and lots of things uh, 
kind of combine to produce an outcome that when you kind of stand back and look at the history of how it happened, you kind of say, yeah, well, I can see why that happened. But it was something that would have been very hard to predict given the knowledge that the first, that the people who were kind of undertaking the things that had these side effects could ever have, have imagined at the outset. So it's hard to find somebody to blame for it really, because they were folks who were working with the knowledge that they had, trying to accomplish the goals that they had, but some other stuff happened as well. And people have a tendency to say it's not natural just because we did it too, which is like, this is kind of the segue into the whole, what is a novel ecosystem and like, novel ecosystems, right? You know, the San Francisco Bay is a really good example. From what I've read about the San Francisco Bay, just because of how it's, you know, uh, situated like on the Pacific Ocean and the coastline of California, it's always had a circulation and inflow of new species for a long time. And it's always been changing in that one of the only consistents uh, in the ecology of the Bay Area is the change because of just like the change that the ocean brings with it constantly. It's only fairly recently that we have had even remotely the capability of trying to do a complete inventory of any place. Yeah. And so quite often we have very little idea what it was like any, any other point. So there could, you know, other than by the evidence of, so you could find evidence of, for example, in, in the middens, the trash that people left a thousand years ago of the kind of things that they were eating. And if the kind of things that they were eating are not things that are there anymore, then you can make a case that something fundamentally had changed. But, but the evidence for exactly what uh, a place like San Francisco Bay entailed once upon a time is pretty sparse. So there's a lot of inference, you know, there's a lot of best guesses um, and you know, it's kind of like the fossil record <laughs> you, you just, we have bits and pieces and we can kind of say very definitely some things and we can then fr from that point begin to draw inferences based on what we think we know about the way things work today. Um, it's very complicated, but a, a point I want to make though, when we're talking about wanting things to be natural and having natural versus cultural cultural, for example, is a dichotomy. If we, if you were to, if you, if, if you were to, to take as, as a premise that humans are natural, then the whole concept collapses because it doesn't matter anymore. Um, it doesn't matter what's natural because everything's natural. Everything humans have done is natural. Every, every outcome of what humans has, have done is natural from that perspective you know we could we could just say that so okay so that doesn't help us anymore to say that it's not natural um, because if people are natural and what people do is natural but there's a line that folks are trying to draw trying to find and different people have you know draw it different ways there is a distinction that seems like we all kind of get it and it's hard to really locate specifically and reliably like there's this at some at some point there's a change um but is is again is that real is that Im is that important is it important to say natural is it how do we, how can we understand this in a way that makes it actionable uh, that makes us say, well, we don't like the way things are turning out under the current system. So is there a way we can institute another system or we can change the system or something like that? So these are the, the, the is it natural? Like, is my cereal natural? Is my, <laughs> there's so many things that get called natural. Um, it, it's almost not even helpful anymore to, mm -hmm. to try and have that particular conversation, I think. I mean, we can have that conversation some more, but I, I find it not very productive because once you decide people are part of nature, then everything's part of nature that people have done. 
And if we look at the etymology of the word nature and natural, it, it, it means to be born, you know, it like uh, it, that's a, the root meaning is just being born of and to be born. You know, so it kind of like when you really dissect the word and look at it from that perspective, it, it can't kind of just like a um, unproductive conversation, you know, that doesn't mean that there's certain things that we do that don't have negative consequences and that do have positive consequences, but like the word, the more I've uh, looked into this, the more the word natural and how in nature and how our culture uses and relates to that word and concept just becomes kind of like confusing to me, you know? Well, there, and there are, you know, and that NAT is still the beginning of native as well. I mean, those things are all stuck together. Right. Um, right. So I, <laughs> language is, is, is just as unruly as anything else mm -hmm. as we try and you know we, we can't count on the fact that what somebody meant by by nature once upon a time is what's still meant by nature um yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of drift right there's a lot of mutation um mm -hmm. uh, but so so trying to somehow have the conversation without getting hung up on the words is never easy um True. But uh, yeah, so so where do where do we go from here? Where do you want to take this? I, I would say that that um, talking about this natural, what's not natural, etc. I mean, I, I but let's return just for a moment to uh, the Midwest with all of the vast fields of corn and and the vast fields of soy. And I grew up in Nebraska. I, I'm, I'm familiar with this this landscape, and I visited it again in 2018 uh, with different eyes and was just, of course, astounded, you know, by the fact that you can pull over at the side of the road and see, you know, literally nothing except corn, soy, and then a few little groups of trees here and there where there's a homestead, you know, like out to the horizon, right? So, so you know, bringing in, you know, what, what Gabe was talking about again and two and the differences and, and what you said about, well, we can tell there's a difference. Well, the people who were living in that area before uh, also, uh, you know, were doing things to the landscape on a larger basis and that they were using fire, for example. They were uh, uh, expanding prairie ecosystems and holding forest ecosystems in check, you know, for reasons of uh, um, uh, uh, game management, of uh, encouraging more landscape for the bison. Uh, also, of course, all the different plants that come up in that kind of in, come up in a prairie ecosystem, but which uh, tend to be suppressed once an area becomes covered with trees, right? So we can look at that and we can definitely see a difference between that and then the plowing under 97% of the tall grass prairie ecosystem, literally 97%, right? And then replacing it with these vast monocrops, right? Then just to bring it all the way back to, to the topic of invasives here, we can now stand at the edge of this field. We can look at the weeds growing in the ditch, which, you know, originally came from, you know, Eurasia somewhere. And we can say, oh my God, look at these terrible invasive plants here. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, this is really what sums up the whole damn subject, the whole, you know, cause it's like what invasive plants we, 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 the people who talk about invasive plants and invasion biology, they're never counting that corn and that soy, at least that I ever hear about. They're, that's not invasive because we want that to be there. So what's invasive is the stuff that's coming up in the, up in the fields, I mean, up in the ditches, you know, and uh, from the viewpoint of uh, someone who's an agriculturalist, it's also, you know, the things that are coming up that aren't your crop, you know? So, so well, well yeah. About, yeah, so when we yeah. talk about the damage, quote, damage that's done by, by, quote, invasive plants, part of what's counted in that is the damage which is done to crops that we've planted by weeds, some of which are actually native plants. I mean, okay, I'll, I'll just stop there. Well, you've said, you've said the magic word, which is weed. And there, right. um, so a weed is a plant out of place, a plant right. where you don't want it to be. Right. I mean, when you come down to the to sort of the best fundamental description of a weed, it's a plant where you don't want it. Um, the question of, you know, who's in charge of wanting things to be in particular places kind of kind of is is brought in there. And then so now we're talking about who owns the land or controls it and all of that. Right. Um, but we don't. This, so weed and invasive 
didn't start out together. Those are two kind of different concepts. Weed and right. alien didn't start out together. Those are two different concepts. More, much more recently, those have sort of fused together into the invasive weed, which could be a, a native plant in, in that particular location, or it could be an introduced plant in that particular location. So we get, end up getting into this strange patchwork of, of cross-referencing terms, and you begin to start talking like Donald Rumsfeld and known unknowns and unknown unknown, um, you know, all that kind of that kind of categorization of trying to figure out well, what do you really mean? What do you think you mean by that? But it it helps it helps the weed people, which is a whole you know industrial complex of of anti weediness, um, to attach their idea to the idea of invasive. Yeah. Even though the idea of invasive to an invasion biologist would be the idea of an introduced plant that is spreading rather than, than just behaving itself. So an invasion biologist doesn't care very much about an introduced plant that just you know grows where you put it. Um, even if you put it everywhere, like corn. Mm. You know, it's and and so if corn was spilling out of the fields. If, those, if there were anywhere left for it to, you know, to spill into. But if there were places where corn was just coming up because somehow it spread out of the places where it belonged because we said it belonged there, then corn could be considered invasive. And there are some crops in places that are, you know, can become invasive in that sense. Corn has been so bred to, to hang on to its seeds that it, you know, those, those uh, cobs just don't shatter. The seeds just don't travel, and and unless you know a, a truck dumps them somewhere, um, there are very few processes that could turn corn, as in ZMAs, um, into. And I only say that because in other places, other things are called corn. But um, there's almost no way that corn per se could become invasive in that sense. However, it certainly has somehow convinced a whole lot of people to move it around and plant it as far as they can. And what's different about that from any other seed that's carried by any other animal somewhere in the process of its normal natural distribution? There's all kinds of things that are carried off on, on fur and inside animals. And, you know, there's lots of ways that stuff gets spread. So where do we find the categorical difference? Once again, it comes down to, well, this is what we decided we wanted and, and so it's okay. It's very subjective, it seems like. Yeah, it is. And I think that subjectivity is one of the, when we're talking about something that's supposedly scientific and yet it turns out to be so deeply, utterly subjective. Um, it's, it's probably not the only thing like that, but I don't study everything else. So I, okay. I don't have some <laughs> good examples to sort of bring to the table of, of other places that we do kind of the same thing. Yeah. I think it's, it's an important point to bring up though, just for people who hear these terms, um, the culturally adopted ways that they're interpreted, which becomes a mess as we're discussing, um, is to be reminded that there is value judgment going on when people from different groups are using these words and it's yes. presented as science, but there's a value judgment and it doesn't have to be seen as a, a, as a negative, but just for understanding what we're trying to look at by even bringing mm -hmm. up the concepts. Yes, I agree. I agree that, that there is, there is a, a lot of, you know, to just to stay metaphorical, there's a lot of baggage yeah. that's being carried around. And some of it has seeds stuck to it and they're going to fall off. And anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a, a really hard conversation to have and to keep control of the sort of the frame of reference, the, because people necessarily kind of carry around with them all kinds of um, ideas that they may not particularly realize they've attached here. And one of the worst things you can say to a scientist is, is you know, you're 
being subjective and you don't realize it. Uh-huh. You want to make friends in a hurry. That's a, that's, a way to, that's a way to really make friends with the scientists to say, you're not being objective and you don't even realize it. Uh-huh. Um, so, so that usually doesn't end well, right? One thing that, um, so it, just like with the, the whole big subject of like value judgments and like the emotive wartime language that is basically the language used to talk about invasive species and invasion biology. And like, um, I was wondering, did the wartime language like with like, like an example is a ecological catastrophe or, um, you know, like people will literally say things that like the, the, the native species are like, these ev- or the invasive species are like evil and they've declared a war on the native species. And, and there, there is like a wartime terminology used. Did that originate with Charles Elton because he was in world war two doing like um, basically extermination of like rats and mice to protect the food rations and stuff. So I, I, I've been curious, like did that kind of originate that wartime language originate with Elton or did, is it older than Elton or did he just like make it more popular? Mm-hmm. As far as I've been able to tell, it originated with Charles Darwin. Mm-hmm. Darwin. If you look at Darwin's description in the voyage of the Beagle. So this is 1839. This was published the voyage when he was on the Beagle, he was, that was, they took off, they left England just at the very tail end of 1831 and got back sort of the last, you know, October or something of 1836 after going all the way around the world. But having spent the vast majority, sorry, the vast majority of that time banging around back and forth around the southern tip of South America, drawing maps. Um, so most of Darwin's experience on the Beagle Voyage was actually in southern South America, Argentina, Chile, that, that whole area. Um, he spent like six weeks in the Galapagos and didn't even realize necessarily what he'd gotten into until they got back with that stuff. Um, anyway, so Darwin in describing an experience he had in Argentina where he came across a vast area that seemed to be covered primarily in European thistles and wild artichokes, which is two different species, but very similar, these tall thorny things. Um, he, he used the term invasion or invaders. You know, this is, so this is what came to mind to him. Now, having said that, I don't think invasion biology remembered that actually until I kind of dredged it back up. Um, they didn't seem to, to, to realize it, but Darwin was there. He was under military escort most of the time. Uh, the Spanish empire had just collapsed. All these people were sort of vying for control in these, in these regions, in these new countries. And so uh, um, he, was, he was on a British Navy ship. Um, he was not a member of the Navy or working for the Navy, but he was, he was there. So this, all, this whole thing is very military in, in context. And so it's not unusual to imagine him coming up with a military metaphor for a place where there's all of these plants from somewhere else who are, that are, you know, have to all appearances excluded whatever was there before. Why this happened, you know, he doesn't really get into particularly because I don't think he knew, he just happens on this situation and here it is, and this is what he thinks of. Um, It, invasive as an idea was something out of, actually already out of like arboriculture, out out of tree plantations I've found uses of the word in various places where people are talking about plants that are kind of encroaching on on the plants that they're trying to grow. So invasive things kind of coming in is, is a word that's already out there. Charles Elton um, very definitely was influenced by World War II. Um, and so I, th- but, but there's a thing about this is that his book, The Ecology of Invasions by Animals and Plants, that was not his preferred title. That wasn't his idea. He wanted to call it Ecology and the Millennium. Huh. And so it was in some, some sort of 
discussion with the publishers and I haven't seen documentation of this. So it might not have been ever written down. I sat for a month at Oxford and went through everything in Elton's papers you know, oh, wow. to see what was to see what was going on. That's cool. um, so I've, I've, I've had that experience of reading through everything he left and and then going to to Glasgow and and reading mail between his mother and his uncle <laughs> to find out some more you know insight on on the sort of the family scuttlebutt of this but anyway mm -hmm. um, I, I've never I've never seen that exact explanation of what happened but I do know when it happened and that is you know the manuscripts done this is ecology in the millennium um, and um, they said kind of, no, it's going to be something else. And they, what they agreed on was the ecology of invasions by animals and plants. So he, whose word that was, I don't know. He obviously accepted it and went with it. But if you read the book, he's not really, I mean, the word invasion doesn't show up in the book. Huh. The book was already written by the time it was titled that. It's, it's in there like twice maybe. But he starts out talking about explosions and all kinds of other, there's still military metaphors, but he's not really talking about invasions per se. It wasn't, it wasn't what he set out to do, yeah. but it is the title of the book. And so this is another thing where how many of the people who cite that book have actually read the book? I don't know, but I think um, I have unpublished a, 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 something I've been working on, you know, off and on for a long time, which is collecting reviews of that book written at the time that it came out, say up through, it came out in 1958, so through like 1964, um, to see what, how people were responding to this book. And most of these are written for scientific journals, um, a few for other purposes, but mostly, mostly for journals. Um, and the parts of the book that people were really interested in when it first came out were not all the accounts of various species that were various kinds of problems problems in various parts of the world. It was more the sort of philosophical approach to, to ecology that Elton talked about in the last few chapters, which very strongly echoed what Aldo Leopold had been talking about um, all in almost in so many words. And it's clear that, that either they had accidentally both come up with the same thing or that they had kind of talked about this a little bit together. And we know they had talked together, so, so I'm I'm going with that story, mm -hmm. but um, because so, but it's still it's like a decade after Leopold died, um, and but Leopold and Leopold had already sort of said this, but then Elton says it in very similar language another way. Um, anyway, he with with the whole invasions thing. Um, that just wasn't his intention and, and the folks that who were who were reacting to him were saying we were really intrigued by the sort of philosophical approach to conservation that he has. In 2000, when the new version, when the new edition, which was which is just, you know, a reprint, the University of Chicago Press puts out a reprint in 2000 and Daniel Simberloff, student of Edward O. Wilson's, gets to write the foreword. He wow. says, don't pay any attention to this part at the end. In effect, what you need to be thinking about is all these cases, right? We're, we're not going to go with Elton's ideas about how, how, you know, what all this means. We're just going to say, look at a great job you did of telling us how terrible it all was. Mm -hmm. well, so, I'm yeah, sorry. so it really, really depends on who, who gets put in charge of uh, interpretation and, and uh, revisionism and, um, and public, you know, and publication generally. So what, what was, I mean, briefly, what was that approach that he was talking about then at the end? Elton was basically convinced that these phenomena were inevitable. They were going to be problematic in some cases, but it was inevitable that with the kind of, with the way we were living, the things we were doing, that this was just an outcome that you had to expect. Um, he said, we, we have this sort of three, I was trying to remember this as well as I can. He's had kind of a, what I think I call it sort of a tripod of values that, that, they, that he and Leopold shared. Um, one of them, Leopold called religious 
but Elton called ethical. They both talked about aesthetics and they both talked about practicalities. So there are these aesthetic values um, that we bring to life and how we want to live and, and how we want the world to be. And there are sort of religious or um, ethical principles that we like to be in force. And then there's this, this sort of practicality, which Elton says sort of looms over everything else. Um, and you can find this, you know, again, you'll, you'll find this, you go back and look at Leopold as well. They, they both, they both kind of settled on this way of looking at the world. Um, so Elton was saying, yeah, you know, some of this is really problematic and some of it, some of these cases are just startlingly um, unfortunate. On the other hand, he said, this is, this is what we do kind of that he, he just, he just didn't say, he did not launch invasion biology. He did not say, he did not say from now on, we need to have this whole new effort in science and, and, and do this. This was, this was a side project for him. This was something that was just sort of eating at him. And he finally kind of did this book. It wasn't his biggest project. It, it wasn't what he personally felt was his most important one. Um, and that, act, that pattern actually follows throughout the history of people talking about introduced species. By and large, they picked it up as a side project. It was something they kind of noticed in the, in the, in the course of whatever else they were doing and it kind of reached some sort of critical mass for them and then they would write a paper about it and then they would put it down and they would go on and do something else again. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of the pattern until uh, 1980 something. Um, when some folks got together and said, we, well, this was a, actually a, at a specific meeting in, in Africa about Mediterranean ecosystems and Mediterranean ecosystems don't just exist around the Mediterranean. You know, Southern California has got a Mediterranean ecosystem, parts of Australia, et cetera. A whole new, a whole new topic, a whole new set of classifications and, and choices. Um, but you know, they're talking and they say, oh, well, we've got these things happening. And the other people say, oh yeah, I've got that same thing happening here. And this was sort of that moment that gets credited with, with being sort of the, the birthplace um, of sort of modern invasion biology. But a whole lot of things had to change in conservation thinking and environmentalism, a whole bunch of stuff had to happen post Elton so there's this long incubation. And then they, these guys kind of looked back at Elton and said, oh yeah, so here's our inspiration. And fortunately, mm -hmm. Elton had been very good at sort of, of keeping a low profile generally. So he wasn't strongly known anywhere else for, for much that they had to overcome. They just kind of adopted him in retrospect and said, this is, this is our guy. Mm. Right, and so, oh, go, go ahead. I just wanted to say real quick, I mean, it's just more like a snippet, like, because Daniel Simberloff seems to be like one of the big heads in like the invasion, like, when, and uh, in, that, that informs a lot of like in, invasion biology. And I've seen like some of his writings where he explicitly states that like non native plants just shouldn't be there and that they're like all kind of bad if they're not native, you know, not really just like if they're invasive that they're not good, but just like the fact that they're non native. You know, and I've definitely noticed that about like Simberloff that he takes that stance and he was part of like the creation of the creation of like the National Invasive Species Council during the Clinton era when he wrote, he was part of the group that wrote the letter to like the administration about and used the language of like there's an ecological catastrophe looming for us and um, so that yeah that's one thing I've noticed about about uh, Simberloff. I, I don't want to put words in Dan's mouth or simplify, oversimplify what he says because he's, he is not that categorical. Um, I have my students read his book uh -huh. and I will disappear from you briefly. So, so Simberloff has kind of taken the mantle of leadership for invasion biology, um, for better or worse. And 
you know, he can write books called Invasive Species, What Everyone Needs to Know, and seriously believe that what he's telling them is, you know, everyone needs to know this, and, and apparently this is all they need to know. Um, and he makes the case, but he does not make a simplistic case. As my students will, will attest uh, to their chagrin, he is very wordy and, and very detailed. And he tries, to make, uh, he tries to make the case that this is all much more nuanced, but he doesn't really give up any ground in that process. He never really allows that this can be good. There's either the things that don't matter or those things that are problems. None of this is commendable in any sense. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed that. So you, oh, did you want to say something? Um, yeah. It, it was just occurring to me as I'm listening to you all talking and bringing up stuff that it, it seems like there's this process of um, uh, cultural usage of some of these concepts becoming more fragmented or used as sound bites. Like the, the part where I focus my attentions or concerns a lot is the application of going after invasives, um, especially like on the big river systems of the West, uh, where then everywhere you see one of these so-called invasive plants, you want to eradicate it, um, irrelevant of the landscape changes that have happened. So I, I don't know, it was just a funny thought I was starting to formulate that it's, it's like a fragmented ment cultural mental landscape that's taking these pieces and running that is unable to leave room for the nuance when it has that hold. <laughs> yes, and this takes us back to this idea of that root, root metaphor, the constitutive metaphor. There is no case in which you can say, un unless, unless, it's, unless, you're, unless you're organizing it, there is no case in which telling someone there's an invasion going on immediately makes them say, oh, good. I'm sure <laughs> glad there's an invasion going on. Now, it's, uh, once again, we can't be completely categorical about it because if you said this to a bunch of people in May of 1944 and you were in England um, and we were saying, we're about to invade the continent again. Oh, good, finally. Finally, we're going to go and, and, and take the fight to the Germans. So that's an, an example of an invasion that from one point of view was welcome news. Mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from the point of view, however, from the point of view of the people that the invasion was coming at, right? When the invasion is coming at your face, then an invasion is typically not a good thing. You can't get away from that. So as soon as we use the word invasion, we're talking about something that has that connotation. And when we extend it to saying, not only are these things invading, they're undertaking an invasion, but they are constitutionally, characteristically invasive, that mm -hmm. this is what they do. And to go back to say, the Terminator, it's what they do. It's all they do, right? This mm -hmm. is, this is, this is, these are bad actors. These are problems. These are out to get us. There's no good thing about what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. This is the part that really sticks in the popular mind when they yeah. hear the term invasive. And, you know, I, I'm a member of, I, I'm on the, um, on a Facebook group for the California Native Plant Society. And I'm on there because it's awesome for plant ID. I'm out taking a hike. I see a flower. What is it? I, I, I post a picture, you know, five minutes tops usually because there's, you know, 12,000 people in the group or whatever. And someone identifies it. That's great, you know. But then there's constantly this talk about, you know, invasives there. The term is used in all sorts of different ways as in, oh, it's, it's something that spreads enthusiastically or et cetera, but, but everyone seems to, you know, and so they talk about native plants as being quote invasive as well. I mean, but behind all of it, there's sort of this assumption that, oh, there's a scientific concept backing this up, you know, that, that, that the designation of invasive, you know, that that's a 
that's a, that's a, as an intrinsic characteristic of this plant that that's scientifically backed up. I might not know that science myself, but I'm sure it's there. That that's sort of uh, people assume that there's something that's backing that up. So when you talk about Elton, you know, talking about his, his, uh, you know, concerns were the ethical, the aesthetic and the, and the, and the practical, but, but not, you know, per se the scientific, I mean, I, I feel like it goes back a ways and I feel like, I feel like this is, this is the most, this is, this is what's Im important in that consequences come out of people assuming that this is a scientific concept and these consequences include spraying poisons everywhere they include you know uh, 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 all sorts of removal projects you know that are that are massive that aren't that aren't really that, that, that often aren't thought through you know very clearly you know and so I feel like that's just um, maybe kind of a point that we need to to make at this point as well is just to distress that it's not really a scientific word. I would, I would really like to know, honestly, what people are thinking, because I don't always know why people are thinking what they're thinking and how these particular terms appeal to them um, in various circumstances. There, are, there, is, there is so much kind of rolled into this. Um, I think a lot of people who are become advocates for natives, any things, are generally, and I'll be general here, are, are seeing them as underdogs. They're seeing them as put upon. They're seeing them as, as having been uh, ill-used and, and they need an advocate. Um, there are other people, I mean, but native plant gardening, when it first got started, wasn't so much about conservation as it was actually kind of being, you know, having a sort of rarefied identity as a, as someone who is into this particular kind of thing and not some other, it was just like being into some particular kind of rose or being into some particular kind of other plant. Um, it was, so there, there are lots of versions of, of this. And I think you have to really think of any of these sort of social movement kind of things, very much as coalitions rather than as monoliths. They have certain kinds of interests and values in common. Um, any two of them, you get, get them together and they're gonna, you get them talking long enough and they're gonna find something to argue about, <laughs> but, right? So like any coalition, but there, there, are these, there are these aspects of it that seem really overridingly important and they get together on. Not everyone who's in, involved in these is gonna be very happy about, for example, the extensive use of chemical pesticides, right? This whole, this whole new um, embrace in environmentalism, uh, embrace of environ, in, among environmentalists of chemical suppression of alien plants, that was a coup for the biocides industry. Being able to make that connection that would have been unthinkable at some point, I think just post Silent Spring, um, to say, you know, what, what we really need, Ms. Carson, is to go deploy all of our various um, chemical weapons on all of these introduced plants. I think that would have been sort of antithetical to the mood that it was produced by Silent Spring. Um, so, so the fact that they've been able to make that move, and I'm, uh, it would be fascinating to actually document uh, the process, if you could, by which it became acceptable to, to people who are primarily interested in, in nature conservation and, and you know, trying to keep natives native and all that stuff, but have then accepted this idea that we should be attacking everything else with the stuff that was causing a lot of the problems in the first place. Wow. It's, you know, it's amazing. It is really an amazing kind of thing that I haven't had the, the you know, there's only so much of me to go around and try and, and follow some of these stories, but that one, how did how did that happen? How where were what were the turning points? Where were the where was the moment when somebody from some mainstream 
environmentalist organization said, hey, that sounds like a good idea mm -hmm. because, because why? Because somebody was going, some corporation was suddenly going to support them. I mean, where, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's messy. It's messy stuff. This is yeah. the, the subject I circle around a lot in the research work I've been doing. And um, it's really incredible how much all of the land management protocols uh, tout herbicides as the most environmentally friendly thing to do at this point in time. Like it's really actually hard to find other examples to try to collate uh, different processes that might help you get uh, certain results to support certain species in different habitats uh, that don't involve selective use of herbicides as the number one tool above all others. It's really yeah. incredible and frightening to me, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, can, I can only add that when I was working with a lot of people who were particularly interested in natural areas, and the, you know the, the whole idea of, of what's a natural area and what's not natural mm -hmm. and what's, an, what's even an area. I mean, you, you can actually get heavily involved in this. But um, I can remember going to you know, so vegetation management was part of this problem, um, and I can remember going to a vegetation management meeting, and there are door prizes, and the door prizes are gallons of herbicide you know this is it was uh, this so this is by the sort of the late probably 1997 98 something like that but this was already the move is already afoot that that the people who are going to be managing for natural conditions this is your tool and we're going to just give it to you so have some fun wow yeah I wouldn't have guessed that it had gone back to then. I would have pinned it um, at uh, the Invasive Species Council that Gabe referred to before that came about during the Clinton era. Because I've, I've looked into that a little bit. And, you know, Monsanto and DuPont were among the players who were involved in the formation of that council. They helped yeah. write the original documents, you know. Yeah. And when they're talking about invasive species there, they say that they're they're concerned about the economic and the environmental impacts of them. And they're putting economic first, you know? And so it's just, it's, it's another one of these cases where, where yeah, people have come to see uh, the designation of invasive species and um, the eradication of them as being uh, primarily an environmental or a conservation concept. But in fact, it, it was never, never that to begin with. It was, there were always other considerations that, that were in play, uh, you know, many of them agricultural, you know, obviously, you know. Well, you know what they say, follow the money. Right, um, right. And, and, this, it, and th it goes back to what Leopold and Elton both realized that this practical, and I will, I'm, I'm resisting air quotes, this idea <laughs> of practicality looms over everything else. Um, when people are deciding, I mean, there is just this thing that has to happen, you know, to for for the sake of um, continuities of various kinds, which may be commendable continuities, or they may not, depending on your point of view. But um, a, a different sort of sustainability, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another interesting thing that. Uh, well, I, I really love your paper, The uh, Invasion of the Second Greatest Threat. It's very well written and it's fun to read. Um, you talk about the origin a little bit of biodiversity as a concept and as a language and uh, how, I don't know if you, I don't, I don't think you quite worded it this way, but it, it, you, you alluded to it in like it becoming this like moral value for people to jump on the high horse of, you know, an advocation of biodiversity, but how the concept of biodiversity is kind of tricky. And um, you, you even put a quote from the guy who uh, coined the term in the paper saying like, uh, like when he coined the term, he, he said it like biodiversity is taking the logical out of biological end quote. 
I think I, I quoted that yeah. right. But could you could you speak to the complicated concept and almost like the elusive the elusive substance of, uh, of biodiversity and how it's kind of like a slippery slope once you start doing research into the cultural political um, dynamics around it, you know, like I'm still struggling to understand it myself, which has been why I've been excited to like ask you about it. Cause I, I feel like I get a lot of conflicting answers and bigger questions when I research this. Right. Um, I've written a lot of stuff and unfortunately it, I don't have it all loaded into RAM at the moment. So I can't remember every <laughs> bit of it. If you want to pull up the paper and figure out the guy's name who did this. Um, Walter Rosen. Uh, Yes. Okay, well, Rosen, right, Walter Rosen. Wow. Good, excellent. Um, <laughs> so, so the back around 1984, 1985, um, Rosen, E.O. Wilson, some other people were trying to come up with a an organizing principle, a theme, some something for a conference that they wanted to put on, um, and. It was it was an advocacy event. It was not a science event. It was an advocacy event. Okay, so that was that was understood to be the purpose of all of this thing. Um, and so, uh, among the things that got tossed out was this contraction, biodiversity. And as you say, Walter Rosen quipped at some point, you "No, know, it's taking the logical out of biological diversity." taking the logical out because the point was not to produce a scientific concept, but to produce something that could be advocated for a, a sort of a value proposition that wasn't even quantifiable. I mean, if it were scientific, we could quantify it, but it wasn't about quantity. This was about, this was a quality, this biodiversity thing. And so biodiversity becomes the title of a book and then later of another book. Um, but it was always a thing to be, a thing to be desired, right? That biodiversity and this idea that sort of the more, the better, the more diverse, the better, the more, the more different places. And it's included a lot of things. Remember the scale of, of, thinking about biodiversity is everything, they'll, they'll say it's everything from the genetic to the planetary. What are we talking about? It's very kind of unclear because it can be anything. Apparently it can't be nothing, but it can be anything. Um, Except but it case. sounds so good. It's life and it's diverse. And like, that's one of the, it's, it's, got, you know, it's catchy that way. Um, and why not like that? And I can remember in 1986 having that book in my hand um, and being, you know, we were excited, college students and thinking about like, what, is, what does this mean for all this conservation stuff we're running and doing? This is when I was trying to, trying to become a park naturalist type. Um, but uh, yeah, so the funny thing that happened is that biodiversity managed to migrate or be migrated from this very qualitative conservation imperative, this thing to be advocated for into the scientific literature where it started being treated as a quantity. I remember a formula in school for it. Yeah. And there is alpha diversity and there's beta diversity and there's gamma diversity and there are different ways of comparing different things, right? And those, they don't always say biodiversity, but this, it was like, there was alpha diversity before there was biodiversity. So diversity was a thing, but these concepts kind of got merged mm. in the conservation biology literature. And they stuck together like that to the point that biodiversity is now kind of naturally seen as a scientific concept when it isn't. And it wasn't to begin with. It's gotten, it's gotten kind of glommed onto this other idea. I mean, diversity, we can calculate diversities. There is an actual quantifiable science, sciencey thing that you can do there. And alpha, beta, gamma diversities are all different things that you can 
you can compare different ways and and they can tell you something about the world but this biodiversity thing is a much different vaguer uncontained concept wow. um and and it's you know so then from there to saying that something is a threat to biodiversity. Okay, so <laughs> if, if diversity is a number, if diversity is a quantity, what's a threat to a quantity? Is it a threat to turn one number into another number? I'm threatening you 11, I'm gonna turn you into 10. What am I doing? What am I thinking? So biodiversity is, you can have a threat to something you're advocating for, but it's hard to have a threat to something you're counting unless you stipulate in advance that more is better and fewer is worse or vice versa, or that there's some range in which is the good and fewer or more is bad. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of things that you have to account for here that we typically just kind of gloss over in this discussion. Yeah, like I remember reading uh, about how plants considered invasive are not included in the biodiversity indices, like in when they're, they're often not. So in that way, that's, it's it makes more sense understanding it as a, as an advocacy idea rather than a scientific thing. That would make more sense that you wouldn't include those because you don't want to look at them. But taken as a scientific measurement, it kind of doesn't make sense if that you wouldn't be including them. And it's gotten, yeah, so it's gotten to the point where if I recall right in the current edition of the Jepson manual, they just don't include invasive species. They don't include, I mean, they're just not there mm -hmm. um, as, if, as if they weren't there on the ground. Um, right. So the Jepson manual is, is the, the California flora in effect. The, the list of the, the official list of plants, the most official list you can have of plants in California doesn't include things that they just don't want to be in California, even if they're there. And it doesn't include things like citrus. Mm -hmm. You can't find an orange tree in the Gypsum Manual, even if you can find an orange tree in California, um, if, if I'm remembering correctly. And sometimes I'm wrong, and I, I, you know, but check it out. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so if, if these things are not part of some index of biodiversity or some, or some totaling or some summation of it, especially if they're extremely common and they are in effect what we would otherwise consider some sort of a keystone species for that, for that whole system, which does happen, um, there's no explanation for that system otherwise, what are we talking about? Is it just, we're just writing off that whole thing even though there are birds living in it and lizards and rodents and all kinds of other stuff. Um, do we just say, yeah, well, that's all just wrong and, and we can ignore it or we should scrape that off and try something else. This is a really important topic too. I mean, you probably, I'm sure you heard recently about the uh, low reported numbers in monarch butterflies this year. Yeah how it was uh, tremendously low. And I was starting to look into this uh, topic a little bit. And uh, one thing that I found was that um, many of the favorite roosting sites of the monarch butterflies along the coast are eucalyptus trees. And there's a reason for this is because eucalyptus trees are tall. And so uh, shorter trees along the coast would not actually be good. They wouldn't, they wouldn't serve as good roosting points because it's the taller trees is, is somehow getting them out of the wind more or getting, I'm, I can't remember exactly what the, the reason was, but there was something about how taller trees were suitable for, or far more suitable for roosting sites than shorter trees. And there actually aren't taller trees that are native to the California coast in these areas. And so it was really interesting because it was like, okay, one reason to quote, save native trees and native plants and to keep on invasives is because that's what the, you know, the native fauna, you know, want. And yet in this case, we can see that, well, well now wait a minute, uh, the monarchs are actually depending on this, you know. Um, I, I guess that in the literature, if you look back, uh, it's not until after eucalyptus trees were introduced to California and became widespread that 
these large roostings were even mentioned actually i mean this this was i mean i just started to get into all this and was really was really fascinated by it because i'm like oh so so were they not roosting in these large numbers until those trees appeared here you know and then of course it's also true that you know something like you know a, a third of california butterflies at this point you know have come to depend on non-native uh you know non-native plants in part because you know, look at the Central Valley, you know, how many native plants are left there, you know, among the almond groves and the, and the olive groves and the, and the <laughs> rice fields. I mean, you know, like there's nowhere else, you know, obviously they, they've, they've come to depend on it. So I don't know, that's just. I, to, go Holly, to go Hollywood on this, uh, if you think back to Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Right. Yeah. Um, if you create habitat, and things happen upon it, they are going to occupy it if it's suitable for them. Right. Um, who, could, who could be upset about monarch butterflies in California? Well, the, the only reason the monarch butterflies are in California is because we created something that suited them. Um, is it still good? I mean, nobody moved them there. So is that, are they, in, are they invaders or are they what? I mean, aren't they, where are they supposed to be? We always have this problem of where are they supposed to be? Um, and so, I mean, I'm happy to report that I had monarch butterfly caterpillars out here in my front yard in Phoenix on some nice introduced um, tropical milkweeds right. and got to watch them do their whole thing. Um, but they would never have been in this particular spot were it not for a massive federal irrigation project built in, you know, around 1900, there was, there's not a, there's not a, there's not a possibility in the world that there would ever be monarch butterflies here. Um, so it, uh, it just gets pretty complicated. There are so many, there's, there are so many species that have Whose, whose ranges, whose overall ranges have changed as a result of the, um, the, the various things we have done to change land cover in all kinds of places. Um, the world is just, you, you can't unwind this and get it back to, you know, once upon a time. Even people who are into rewilding are often talking about bringing in predators or you know that wouldn't have been here otherwise bringing in something in order to kind of create a megafauna that is long since gone and and long since superseded by other things yeah and those things are going to be superseded by other things eventually too um it's 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 the more you the more you think the more, the more you know about it the more you think about it sort of the more mind-boggling it gets it doesn't get more organized and sensible as you as you as you look into it it gets <laughs> it gets harder and harder to to kind of all reconcile rather than easier yeah i mean i mean in short that the the possibly beneficial well the 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 demonstrated you know beneficial effects uh you know for some creatures in an environment from other species coming in that weren't native there are just that that's just we just we see this you know i mean i you know i'm in southeastern or southwestern new mexico and i planted a bunch of dill in my garden this year for uh, this last summer for for pickles and some black swallowtail caterpillars came because they love it you know yep. and i'm yep. not sure what else they would have been eating around there actually i mean they love that plant you know they love the umbels and if it wasn't for me doing that i mean i don't know you know it, it anyway to the to the black swallowtail butterfly and to the caterpillars this was great that this plant was here yeah yeah, yeah. um and and this is a theme i've sort of run into a lot that um, I can, I can go out to a, if we've had a good wet winter, then I can go out here in the spring to some vacant lot down along interstate 10 and see a vast field of, uh, common mallow, mm. Malva, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of the most ubiquitous weeds in the world of, of agriculture. And so it's going to be big and tall. This stuff is growing up. It's three feet tall and all over it there are painted lady butterfly caterpillars. Um, it's, they're taking advantage of it 
because it's what they do. I mean, it's, this is exactly what the painted ladies needed. Um, painted ladies, by the way, is, is, that's the most common butterfly worldwide. It's everywhere. And, and there's some amazing, amazing research that's been done on, on how these populations work in various places. Um, but, you know, the cascade of things that had to happen in order to make this particular spot a haven for these particular butterflies at this particular time is truly historic in scope. It's vast. It's a, and, and, and yet what we have are these animals living in suitable habitat, doing their thing that they do. This is just, and they don't know any of this stuff. They don't, they, they don't have the, the capacity to care about it as far as I know. They have no idea that, there's, that there is anywhere else, that maybe they have no idea that there is a here. You know, this is what, what we sort of bring to it and dump on all of these things is pretty massive. You know, so yeah. there are some differences between people and these other things, but a lot of that is a kind of, a kind of knowledge that just isn't accessible to them at all. Totally. Yeah, like I, I think about the, the argument for, um, what do they call it? Well, there's inferior forage. So that's one argument for taking out food that somebody's living on because it's not the best food for them. And then um, uh, this, this idea that if you have a, a garden that they come to, but there's not more of it around, it's a trap. Yeah. And yeah. I, I well, just, there, it, sure. I mean, it is, it is reasonable to say that we can, we can talk about ecology and population dynamics in terms of sources and sinks. There are, there's really high quality habitat for some organism in which those things are reproducing like mad, but it's not big enough to contain them all. So they're gonna have to spread out and look for more habitat. And if the rest of the habitat in the vicinity that's accessible to them is not good enough to sustain that same sort of reproductive effort, things are gonna be spreading from the high quality into the low quality and, and dying and not reproducing. And so they're thus the source and the sinks, okay? And that is an actual phenomenon that's been documented. You can see it happening. It is also a dynamic one. It's not necessarily permanent that this area is gonna be the source and this one is gonna be the sink I mean, because stuff is changing. Yeah. Um, but we can, we can make a certain set of, of assertions that this is kind of the way the world works, that things are patchy and because they're patchy, some places are better for some things and some places are better for other things. And, you know, then you get into all the dynamics of predator and prey. If there's a whole lot of, of some organism being produced here, then it becomes a resource and it's going to be found. And then maybe it's all going to get eaten up and then the predator thing is they're going to crash. Their population has nothing to support them anymore. So they either go somewhere else and try to find something else or they just begin to die off. And this is one of the things we see as being apparently kind of normal, the way things work. It's ugly because it goes against the sort of old, uh, very old static balance of nature idea. And it actually takes us back to Charles Elton because he was one of the people who sort of began to figure out that there was this kind of ongoing dynamic and, hmm. and this massive uh, boom and bust thing was just kind of the way it seemed like the world worked, at least as far as they could see at the time. And it's still a, sort of a classic illustration. One of the things Elton is actually remembered for is his work taking... Um, data from, of all places, the Hudson's Bay Company, Hudson's department stores today, um, or at least recently, I don't know if they still exist the way things are going, but because um, they had people out trapping, producing, bringing in furs, the furs they were going to use to make stuff, to make hats, to make coats, whatever. Um, and it turned out that, that there was, over time, a, an interesting dynamic in the number of furs that were actually available from, from say Canada. Um, and so he began to use their actual data for what was coming into them from the trappers 
as a proxy for, for like how many animals are really out there. So there's a presumption, but it goes, it's going up and down. And then he found that, that sort of, there were the predator numbers tended, tended to go up and down following the way that the, the prey numbers did. So if we're talking about Arctic hare or something like that, um, the numbers of Arctic hare and the number of, of, of Arctic foxes were coupled, the number of, of lynx were coupled into this and, and they kind of followed each other in this weird sort of laggy pattern. Um, and they, you know, they didn't get it totally regularized or anything, but they were able to see that it wasn't just that there was this, this vast array of things living out there, kind of in consistent numbers the whole time, but stuff actually changed quite a bit. Um, and that, you know, things like that just destabilize the way people think and require you to have new ideas. Mm -hmm. Right, because on a historical note, you know, Frederic Clements seemed to be like the father of the climax static stable biotic community right and that's you know long since been like shown to be not true but it still seems to be a very um common sentiment you know and like just an attached people are attached to that worldview and which makes change uh you know it's like this whole conversation of like um, what biological invasions do harm, but is it really harm or is it change? And like, what is change in ecology? Change is the, is the only constant, you know, if you look at like, you know, on the geologic time scale, especially, you know, change is like, is, is evolution, right? So this kind of like brings us into this novel ecosystems conversation, which is like a really important you know, inseparable aspect of this whole conversation is novel ecosystems. And like, what does that mean? It means change and like what, and, and how, how can we, uh, uh, you know, make this term more, I guess, popular or understandable and understand it to people and like relatable to people. Cause I've heard different people say like, Oh, fuck the whole novel evo ecosystems thing. But I've also heard people be like, uh, like other scientists, you know, in places like Hawaii that are like, well, um, Hawaii is more diverse, biologically diverse species count wise. And it's actually ever been because of all of these new and invasive or just like these novel, it's a novel ecosystem that's more diverse than it's ever been, you know? So, uh, and Matt, you, you do teach a, a novel ecosystems course, at university and uh yeah so could you tell us about this and <laughs> yeah professor matt well novel ecosystems is not an idea that i came up with but it's a it's a an idea that richard hobbs and some other people came up with um some of the some of the folks who were involved some, some of the many folks who were involved in in writing a paper called Don't Judge Species on Their Origins. It was published in Nature, um, yeah. I think 2011. This is when we all got together and, and did this. And um, it's, it's a kind of a capsule summary it, it, of, of, a, of an approach. But um, so novel ecosystems, I think the fundamentally important thing about the idea of novel ecosystems is, is just the recognition that ecosystems are open and they change over time. And some of those changes result from what people are doing. That does not make them non-ecosystems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all the things that go in, all the things that go into ecology, all the, everybody eating each other and pollinating each other and all this stuff that's going on is still going on in these places. It may have a somewhat different cast of characters. It may be, it may be continuing to change in ways that we can't necessarily predict very easily, but it's still happening. Um, and so we can still treat them as ecosystems. There was a time when ecologists really shied away from studying anything that appeared to have substantial human effects because that wasn't real ecology. Right. Um, and to go back to 
Frederick Clemens and some of the other early ecologists, I mean, they actually just said this wasn't even worth studying because it wasn't interesting. Mm -hmm. um, now, Clemens wasn't totally stupid or anything. His ideas actually were, um, were true-ish in the places that he studied ecology. This, this change of, of a community through, and he made up, Clements made up lots of words and lots of units and lots of things that might not have actually sort of existed. Um, but, but he was, he was creating a whole, there's no way to have that conversation because there were no words for it. So we always have to make up words for it, whether we, whether we use metaphors or whether we use something else, or we make up something that was nonsense, you know, complete neologism, just, you know, pick some letters and string them together, whatever you're going to do. Um, but the, the development, he could in Nebraska watch a pond if you sit, if it sat there long enough, gradually fill up with organic material, turn into a meadow, gradually, you know, shrubs come in, trees come in, and then, you know, it sits around like that until something knocks it down. Um, that wasn't a, that wasn't a totally wrong idea, but it was not right in a lot of other places besides where he was. Right. And so this, I, I, early on, I mentioned that the sort of, tendency to overgeneralize is a, right. a problem that we have in ecology. Yeah. Anyway, um, so what were we trying to get at here? There was, uh, I've, I've, my, my train of thought has derailed. So what was the, what was the question that we were trying to get at? Oh, yeah, we're just, you know, talking about novel ecosystems. And oh, right, all oh, right, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So what I do in the class is I take my students to places that have very definite histories, human histories. There's something has happened here that has either strongly influenced or completely determined the ecology of the area, what was gonna develop afterwards. Um, and in some cases, they are places where people tried to create or recreate or emulate something that had come before, or some of them are places that were just simply completely ignored. They were, they were generated, there was accidentally, as a result of that, some characteristics of these places that life could thrive. Um, and so we just, go there and I encourage them before we go to do as much research as they can online because there are clues, there are definitely clues to, to all of these places. You can find out something and I give them some of the clues and I make them find the others. But, um, you know, I encourage them to, to do this research ahead of time to find out why, you know, Okay, so Dr. Chu is taking us to this place. He's making us go there. Why? What is, what's the deal here? Um, and they should come kind of with a hypothesis about what they're expecting. And so the ones that do this, you know, I mean, I'm variably successful in, in, in convincing students to do homework because teachers always are. But um, the conversation with the ones who have done this work ahead of time is really fun to just watch, watch the wheels turning and, and, and hear them grinding and, try, and trying to figure out, you know, okay, so yeah, there's stuff living here. In some cases, despite everybody's best efforts to keep anything from living here, um, you know, how, does, how is this working? How, what, is this, what is this telling us? Um, and um, some of the places I take them are, are literally restoration, right? Ecological restoration projects. Um, and some of the places I, I take them to vacant lots, I take them to a soccer field, I take them to lots of different places where we sort of in, in, try to interrogate the landscape a bit. Um, and, and find ways of applying sort of conservation biology principles or priorities or what's, 
the thing. The, the, the theme of the whole course is in trying to let people wrestle with the idea of introduced species and whether they're a problem. I mean, that there's definitely, that's, that's the key issue. And so, I mean, it's inevitably obvious by the time we're done what I think, but I make them read Simberloff's book. I make them read Ken Thompson's book. This one's a lot of fun. Where do camels belong? Oh. Yeah. So, so they have to read those two books together, the, the Simberloff and, and the Thompson book, and then make some decisions. They have to write me a book review as if they're writing for someone who's never read either one. And they have to explain what these guys are saying and they have to tell me what they think about it. I mean, where, where, does, where have you landed as a result of reading these two books um, and taking this course and go, you know, going out on the, on the ground and actually seeing examples of this kind of thing happening? What does it mean? Now you've heard you've heard all the sort of rhetoric that's come at you one way or another through your through your schooling through the media through any any place that you find it, um, but now you've wrestled through this. What do you think? Mm -hmm. What's what's happening here, and what's important, and what isn't? So that's in, in addition to that, then they they're learning a lot of just local natural history. It's a lot of my students have decided to become conservation biologists in college and weren't necessarily raised outdoors, learning plants and animals. Um, if they were raised outdoors, they, this is not what they were paying attention to. So there's, there's a, a lot of catching up to do. Um, some of, uh, on the other hand, some of them have already interned with, with agencies and, and worked in the herbarium and other things. So it's a really a broad range of people and experiences that come to this. And it makes the conversations more interesting, really. To, to yeah. It's fun to watch some people discover this stuff and other people to, to you know, like, oh, yeah, I'm seeing, I, I knew this, but I know it a different way now. So, so that's, that's kind of what the course is about. And it's meant to, to fill a... Uh, a field methods requirement for, for conservation biology and ecology students at ASU. Hmm. Do you ever take audits in your class? <laughs> or sit-ins? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I can't say yes here, can I? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if, if you, you know, you get, a, you get a group together somewhere and, and we want to do this, I, I, outside the auspices of ASU, then, then we, you know, we can talk, but it's, um, that, that apparently is going to become my next career if this gets out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so basically you'll, you'll go to a site and you're doing a, a, a survey. Of sorts. I mean, it's hard to do a survey if they don't know the names of anything yet. Uh, right. right. Mm -hmm. um, so over the court, over the, over a period of time, they see many of the same things over and over again and become familiar with them. At that point, we can begin talking about sort of doing real quantification kind of stuff. And strangely enough, the place I take them to start thinking about quantifying vegetation is the soccer field. But um, mm. because it's the simplest possible situation. It's much more complicated than you think because these soccer fields aren't that well maintained. But <laughs> so there's stuff there that, that you know, the, the parks department doesn't really have in mind. But um, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's, I, I, if I had, if I were doing it with grad students who had come in with some background already in, in, in field work, it would be a, you know, we, we could do it a very different way, but that's, that's not what, that's, hmm. that's not who I'm teaching. I'm teaching people who come from a variety of, of walks of life, most of whom think conservation biology is a good idea and have learned some things about it in classes, but don't have a lot of practical experience. Yeah. Right. And you said that, you know, um, by the end of the course, they're clear kind of what you think or where you stand, you know, about things i don't make them read my papers right 
but in a sort of Socratic way by the kind of questions that I ask them about right. what they've been reading, about what they've been seeing and the things I draw their attention to and all of that. I think they, they realize they're in the presence of, um, I don't know which word to use. Um, my favorite. Skeptic. <laughs> My favorite has to remain the time that some an author in Scientific American called me the gadfly of invasion biology. Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so maybe we should, in keeping with my my identity as a bird watcher gone horribly wrong, maybe that's another another good weird one that we can throw in there. Um, <laughs> am I skeptical of invasion biology? I think I don't even see a way for those two words to go together meaningfully. Mm. So, you know, I mean, if, if it comes down to, to philosophically declaring that to be a category mistake, um, it's, it's hard to find much redeeming value in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you know if a lot of your students end up going and, and browsing through your material that you've written over the years? Well, they know it exists, but they don't have time. I mean, you know, they're already reading three books. <laughs> and, and trying to take other classes and stuff. So some do, I mean, people have, have shown up in my classroom having read some things like The Invasion of the Second Greatest Threat, you know, which is only half the title, it's such a long title. Um, Ecologists, environmentalist experts in the invasion of the second greatest threat, which by the way, is freely available online by the, the publisher. Yeah. If you, if and you, and uh, by the way, I'm going to put your uh, links to these articles in the show notes. Oh, um, okay. Another one, what, what is it called? The rise of biotic nativeness, but the history of the English. The rise, of, the rise and fall of biotic nativeness. Yeah, yeah, I'm um, definitely a, a historic, a historical perspective. Yeah, yeah, I'm and that's one where, you know, that's one where we talk about this, uh, well, a bunch of stuff. So, but yeah. yeah, that's a good one. I like that one. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, I do too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so you said you wouldn't even put the you wouldn't put those words together, invasion and biology, like that. Um, I certainly wouldn't put together invasive species. Right. I don't see any way for species as I understand them. And species is another fraught concept, but I don't see right. any way for, for that which biology describes as species, the way we define the biological species concept. I don't see any way for those things to invade, much less to be characteristically invasive. I just don't think that the two concepts are, you know, have any way to meet. Right, right. Um, and again, invasion biology, since I don't see any way for species to, to actually engage in an invasion it would be hard for me to study them in the process of you know from, from the perspective of that being the process that they're they're undergoing right mm -hmm. i mean because that's that's kind of the, the place i've been coming around to as i study these things is where I've, I've come to this point of like well wait a minute it strikes me that the term invasive species is well it's kind of a nonsense term that's kind of that that's that's the that's how I've put it in my own head. You know, I'm that like, is, that is what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah I mean, you're, really you're saying the same thing. I'm just yeah. being more academic about it. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I appreciate that. But, you know, so, because I mean, I mean, really at most one could describe the particular behavior, uh, uh, the behavior of a species in a particular time and place as invasive, if they feel like using a qualitative term like that. Right? I mean, that's like, maybe the most that could be given to that term is that in a particular context, one could say, I'm just looking for like, what's the most that could be given to the, to the word here, you know? Well, that would, and I think that is the most, and I think, I don't think the word is necessary right. because if we're talking about uh, a population of something that is increasing in numbers and as a result of its increase in numbers is necessarily sort of occupying more space on the landscape, um, well, that's really sciencey. Um, are they in some way competing with other species for something, for resource, for um, for space itself? You know, just there's there's no organism that takes up space that is not denying that space to something else. Uh -huh. um, 
it's not just something people do. It's not just something that you know, our, our stuff does. Is any tree right. on the landscape can can be the only tree there? Um, then I'm trying to think of where to go from that point. Um, it's I don't know. Ask it. Ask ask something else that well, prompts me to continue. Well, one, one thing that like I hear a lot of people say when I'm having these discussions is how they insist that invasive species halt. They they I've literally heard people say that they permanently halt succession and create ecological wastelands. And to me, that just that really doesn't make any sense. You know, like growing up and I grew up in the Southwest and I've watched, you know. I've walked like a, I had to walk a driveway like my whole life, like a half mile driveway getting dropped off by the bus and walking home. And I've like, for like 13 years, I did this and I watched like basically how grazing changed the landscape and how it like changes, you know, just in the 13 years is a really small period of time, but a lot can happen in 13 years. You know, I've seen um, thickets of thistle, you know, whole field taken over by thistle um, disappear and all the thistle gone after five years, you know, and it did its thing there for a while and then it just moved on, you know, and, and I just, I think that the, the, uh, the assertion that people say that e of ecological wastelands and that uh, succession can be permanently halted in the first place, that just doesn't make sense to me and I don't think it's true. I don't think it's true either. And however we want to talk about succession is whether it's, I mean, Clemens talked about a very deterministic kind of process. And right. there are other ideas that are much less deterministic. I mean, there is just this dynamic that occurs with climate, with weather, with a, a variety of, of inputs. I mean, it's, it's the complexity um, is really significantly huge, um, not Absolutely anything can happen, but a whole lot of things can happen over over time. Honestly, if you spent 13 years walking the same driveway looking at a system, you've spent more time than most ecologists get to spend doing that. Yeah. Um, we do routinely, part, one, one thing that's been very typical of ecology for us since its inception is this idea of the sort of the, the space for time substitution, which is we look at, we can look at a whole bunch of different conditions on the landscape and we can then imagine a series of events that would produce the change from this one to this one um, with any number in between, you know, depending on what's available. And kind of that's really what they were doing with the first ideas of succession. Well, I can see here's a pond. Okay, that's a pond, that's good. Now over here's a pond that's kind of got some plants starting to grow up in it and fill it up. And you go, oh, yeah, well, that's gonna be a change. And I can go and see an old pond and this one is now kind of filled up and, and turning into more of a meadow. And I can find another one. And so, all right, so it's perfectly sensible to say that this represents a sequence of events. But I have not seen the sequence of events. I have seen a series of places and I have, and I have interpreted it that way. So is that wrong? Uh, it can be really wrong or it can be really right, but you can't really be totally sure without a whole lot more work and observation. And in the end, each one of these ponds is probably going to go through a little bit different process. Some of them are always going to, you know, going to stay ponds for a very long time. And some of them are going to fill up in a big hurry for, you know, a variety of reasons. Um, the idea that, that these dynamics are going to stop is sort of antithetical to anything we could possibly say about the real world. You know, how can you make something stop? Even putting cattle on the landscape did not stop succession. Um, however, it has always been kind of a tenet of range ecology, of range management to say that there is a particular point in succession that is ideal for raising cattle. Yeah. The most, you're going to get the most bang for the buck. You're going to get the most pounds of, of cow off 
an acre of land under a particular set of conditions that include certain plants, et cetera. So range management, and, and I actually got a degree in range management at one point. So I, I've, I've heard this out of the mouths of range management professors. You are trying to get your landscape to this sort of sweet spot where you're not overgrazing, but you're not undergrazing and the shrubs are not sort of taking over, taking over. There's the air quotes, taking over. <laughs> um, they're, not, you know, they're not taking over anyway, they're shrubs. The shrubs don't take over, they just grow there. Um, uh, it's not just me. Anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway, anyway so, so this idea that you can sort of manipulate the landscape with your domestic animals yeah to the point of your sort of optimum benefit and the optimum benefit being maximum maximum productivity yeah. productivity right what can be bad about productivity things ought to be maximally productive they ought to be maximally efficient they ought to you know there's all these things that we bring into our discussion of how how the world ought to work um, that really you know they don't necessarily all apply quite the way we want them to apply. I don't think that word means what you think it means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to kind of like bring it back around uh, to the like novel ecosystems. Okay. Discussion too. Yeah. So like uh, what, what, um, what makes it novel, right? Is like, what, how, why is this such an important we've already gone through such a big historical talk, you know, and novel ecosystems are presently happened, but into the future, we're really gonna start seeing novel ecosystems more and more. How is this, uh, what makes it novel? And why do people, why is this an important thing to be talking about and, and understanding? Well, as Richard Hobbs et al originally put it, it was just novel because, because people influenced the way it's working um, in some substantial way, and again, the places that I choose to take my students are places that have these, these recountable histories that we can say, this is sort of the series of events that we know happened here. But in on into the future, um, I think a lot of people, it's not just me, that, that there's quite a common uh, sense these days that the world doesn't sort of get a redo. Um, in trying to force some pre-existing condition on any places is not only a bad idea, it is a totally impractical idea. Um, life is going on around us. Things are, things are moving and getting moved and they're adapting and, and co-adapting and evolution is continuing. And this doesn't, just, it just doesn't go backwards. You, you can't stop this and make it like it once was. Even if we really knew a moment in time where we had enough of a description of what was happening that we could emulate that. Well, typically, I think the most ironic thing about a lot of restoration efforts is that they're aiming for the zero data year. They're aiming for the time when nobody was there to even Mm -hmm. take inventory and explain you know so, so we don't have you know all, all we have is the idea that it was before the white guys got there yeah and there's something there's something to that i mean something some some substantial things really began to change at that point on the other hand there's just no description even if you even if you could kind of force a return to those conditions somehow, which is really a fraught proposition. We don't know what they were. We just don't have them. We have, we can draw some inferences. Um, you know, you can go and take pollen, sam pollen core samples out of lake sediments. So you can do a bunch of stuff that give you some sense of what was probably there. Of course, if you're doing lake sediment sampling and looking at pollen grains in those sediments. A lot really kind of depends on which way the wind was blowing that year um, mm -hmm. as to what might end up in the lake. So, so huge contingencies and, and caveats yeah. in all of this stuff. 
it's it's just yeah the idea of going back there and return you know the conversation itself is returning to sort of the golden age idea um is we just don't know what that was we're just assuming that there was such a thing and that that, that and that that time was right because we hadn't screwed it up yet mm -hmm. um but it's you know that's to me it just sounds like a an impossible task or at worst a fool's errand to try and to try and think that we could do that maybe what we need to be thinking about is kind of how to survive from where we are which is we kind of know a few things about that not all of them because it's you know if i went out to do a real serious ecological survey of some place especially a big place by the time i got it done and reported it all it wouldn't be like that anymore anyway Mm -hmm. So this is tough stuff to really try to, try to get a handle on. Wow. And, and I would just add to that, that in some cases, I think in, in, um, in, in, um, in the United States and, and, and more so as we go to the West, we would have some idea of what was in a place before white people came and that there were some, uh, there, there were some, some strong traditions in those places among the native people. And there were, there was their own oral tradition. There was their own um, stories. There were, you know, and a lot of that's of course been fragmented, you know, as well, but, you know, of course that type of knowledge of place and those kinds of inventories are generally ignored, of course, too, you know, um, you know, when, when we talk think, about yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, untrammeled wilderness, yeah. for example, is, you know, ignoring, you know, those influences from before. Right. And, and this brings us into a, a whole nother um, realm of sort of environmental history and, and, and historical environmental justice and, and lots of things that, right. that are, you know, we, we're going to be talking, we, we can podcast for a long time on, on <laughs> you know, just on, on things that we've begun to raise here. Right. Um, so I don't think there's a good, I don't think we have a good sense of, what kind of information might actually be out there that's, that has survived in an oral tradition because, because the people whose oral tradition this is have been themselves sort of uprooted from contact. And so to them, instead of being lived experience, for many of them, these are, these are stories that, that you can't, attach you can't to the ground you can't see them happening i mean the people so many people were moved to you know out of the places where their traditions right. were um uh formulated um it's it's a you know it, it's one <laughs> one among many tragedies right that that, that kind of uh, play into all this you probably know uh, that very thick book, Ethnobotany by Daniel J. Mormon, where he basically- I think there's a copy of it in the house somewhere. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 big. It's like 800 pages, yeah, yeah. it's huge, right? Yeah. yeah, I've got a copy of that here, fortunately. And one thing I noticed when I first went through that book and was going to the species was that there were all sorts of um, non-native species that were in there. And to me, this, this uh, I just, I'd noticed that and I'm like, oh, well, you know, yeah, new plants showed up and, and, and they found uses for them and started using them for these things. And, and I thought that was, that was interesting too, just, just in how it sort of showed that there was a different worldview that was going on there, or that there's some of these ways of looking at things that are definitely very Western anyway. I mean, a lot of, you know, th that's being aware of our, of our sort of Western prejudices and stuff like that is something that I think, you know, we all need to work on. And when we're looking at all these things, scientists and non-scientists, you know, alike. Western, Northern, right. I mean, you know, and, and it's, um, I, I, from what I've seen, this is again, getting back to this sort of coalition 
right. between a, a big array of attitudes and understandings and this is a sort of crazy quilt of of ideas some of which some of which match and some of which don't and um they're it's it's too complicated to account for with a sort of simple story of any kind. Right. Um, other than that, somewhere in this process of becoming civilizations, we and becoming specialized, we have you know as economically specialized people and stratified into into the kind of complex economies that we have. Um, most of us have really no connection personally to uh, immediately to what's happening out on the land and haven't and just aren't there. And, and even for someone who, who knows that and pays a lot of attention to it, I'm spending most of my time in offices talking on zoom, um, you know, instead of, so, so whatever I've managed to collect in, in my time so far is, may may exceed the average by quite a bit on the other hand um i can get if, if i started list listing the things that i don't know that i really like to know we would take a long time <laughs> yeah so where does that leave us that i i've kind of gone through the things that i was curious to ask you about yeah okay i could come up with more but it just goes somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, we can try another day if you know yeah. if you run out of, if you run out of a, yeah. This could be uh, a continuing conversation. It's uh, already been on about three hours. Oh pretty, my gosh! Okay. I, I noticed that. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't know that. What time you know, batteries have been dying and all of this stuff. So, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. well, I mean that that sounds like a good wrap right there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I, all I can say is that. That's what I think, <laughs> and and I, I can't promise you that that uh, that it's right, but mm -hmm. it's it's the best I can come up with so far. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. really appreciate you spending this time with us today. Yeah, it was really um great to uh, talk to you about these subjects. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, you know, like I said, if you uh, if you come up with something else that you think I can help with, let me know. But otherwise, maybe our next conversation should be about tamarisk. I'm just going to put it out there. I, I, just want, I, don't want to, well, I know you've recently tamarisk. talked. To, yeah, I know you've talked about tamarisk a bit, but I am involved in a in a um, National Science Foundation grant proposal right now that, if funded, is going to give us a whole big new story about tamarisk. So um, nice. we, can, we can, but, but that's not going to happen this week. That's, that's a, that's a four year project if it gets right. funded. And, and so yeah. I like my, my co, my co-investigators are, are at Texas tech university and um, they're trying to get this thing finalized and submitted. Cool. So we'll see, but yeah. Um, my view of Tamarisk is more historical and less ecological than Julie's. Mm -hmm. um, so we can, uh, but if you've seen what I've written about it, then you, you already know that. Um, yeah. But we're looking, I mean, we're, find, we're finding a whole bunch of new facts, new old facts. We're finding a, we're finding a, a whole bunch more about where this stuff came from and who was distributing it and how it different yeah. versions of it got to different places. So if this project gets funded, we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of genomic investigation and a whole bunch more historic digging to see how we can match up these, the available stories about how Tamarisk was being moved around with actual genotypes on the ground. So that, you know, which, which could be, you know, really a lot of fun. And so I hope that it gets, I hope that it gets funded because it's, it's sort of a way to finish the project I started on the history of Tamarisk introduction in the US. Cool. Me too. That's I'm great. excited to hear more about the hybridization of different Tamarisk species in the Southwest and endemic, I'm gonna say yeah. endemic Tamarisks that are technically Tam native now. Tamarix Americana. South Tamarix Americana. Yeah. There is, there yeah. is, and there's probably, there's probably, there may be more than one species 
Oh, it, lower, it, that exists lower. only here, right? Uh, but but it, we don't know yet. Okay. I feel very full and satiated and satisfied with that. <laughs> okay. Fun. Matt, you're, you're great. We really appreciate you taking three hours to do this. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, all you have to do to get get an um, academic to talk to you is ask them what they're interested in. You know, yeah. <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. So, okay, watch out, it's coming, right? Yeah. <laughs> Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big C. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.